Good morning. I'm calling to order the Planning Commission meeting for December 1st, 2016. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the clerk call roll? Commissioner Callie? Here. Commissioner Onstad? Here. Commissioner Dukas? Here. Commissioner Kessley? Here. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Thank you. Now is the time for public comments. This is time set aside for comments by citizens on matters not appearing on the agenda. Are there any public comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to item five, approval of the October 20th, 2016 minutes. Move adoption of the minutes. Second. Please vote. Richard. Is this something that we're doing on the machine? Or not doing it. <laughs> okay, so bear with us. <laughs> but it's a nice big screen. <laughs> we just sit. Yeah, mine's not up either. It's not up. I've got approval uh, on the floor, but I don't have any way to vote. Yeah, same here. Mm. Okay, here we sorry. go. <laughs> Yay. Okay, the next item is PL 15-0150. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair, uh, members of the Commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Matt Sauter. I'm the case planner with the Ventura County Planning Division. Uh, here for uh, case number PL150150. So, I guess just as a brief summary, the, uh, this is a PD permit for the construction or the demolition and construction of a uh, new duplex on Ocean Drive. In along the beach, so uh, this is uh, the general vicinity, um, just outside the harbor area. Um, you can see Ocean Drive here, and then this cross street is Santa Ana, and then this small area right here is a beach access point uh, from Ocean Drive to the beach. So the zoning of the uh, subject property is residential beach harbor. The general plan uh, designation is existing community urban reserve. And the coastal area plan designation is residential high density 6.1 to 36 dwelling units per acre. So the surrounding uh, properties are to the north. There is a multi-family dwelling unit uh, that's zoned uh, coastal residential plan development. Uh, to the west is the beach. To the east are single family dwellings and to the southeast is another single family dwelling. So this is a view from the street to the uh, current uh, triplex that exists on the site. So beach access way, uh, multifamily dwelling to the north. So we're looking, of course, to the coast. So the permit history is the first permit that we could find in the county records is in 1975, which is a building and safety inspection report regarding electrical work on the site. The first planning division issued permit is a zoning clearance number uh, 33637 for a second story addition to the uh, what at the time was still a triplex but only one story. And then on February 15, 2016, the planning director approved uh, PD permit PL150150 for the demolition of the existing triplex and construction of a new two-family dwelling. 
Uh, March 3rd, uh, the appellant today filed an appeal of the plan director's uh, determination. So the applicant for the project requests the demolition of the existing triplex and construction of a new two-family dwelling. So each of the new dwelling units uh, that would share a wall would be 5,684 square feet. Each dwelling would be uh, serviced by a two-car garage and have deck space on the back beach side of the house. Uh, the dwelling would comply with the uh, coastal zoning ordinance and be a maximum of 28 feet tall, and no native vegetation would be removed to uh, construct the project. So this is a, a site plan. Uh, demonstrating the compliance with the setback requirements of the coastal zoning ordinance. So it sits back 20 feet from Ocean Drive uh, via its um, uh, driveway. The side yard setbacks are three feet each, and the required rear setback to the beach uh, property line is six feet, and they comply with that. Uh, the proposed elevations, so the Structure would be 28 feet tall, uh, which is permissible within the county or the coastal zone. So the environmental review of the project, uh, the planning division determined that the proposed project is categorically exempt from CEQA under uh, class three, uh, section 15303 for new construction or construction of small structures. So, and this specifically applies to duplexes or similar multifamily residential structures, totally no more than four dwelling units. So in this case, uh, the project is exempt from CEQA. So the appellant's grounds of appeal today are, um, they provided a number of comments to, uh, in advance of the approval of the original project, um, including uh, that uh, it appeared that the project would impact uh, affordable housing uh, within the coastal zone and would remove that and replace it with what appeared to be expensive uh, two family housing. So um, the planning division uh, attempted to uh, determine the rental levels of the area um, and do anything we could to uh, determine the, um, whether it was affordable housing or not. And we based our search on Zillow and uh, rental rates in the area as was done for the county general plan housing update. Um, and so, however, we found County General Plan Policy 3.2.2-2, parentheses 2, um, which states that lower and moderate income rental housing located in the coastal zone shall be concurrently replaced within three miles, if feasible, when two or more such units are converted or demolished. And so we had a case where um, we were demolishing three units, and so we needed to determine if the proposed project would comply with this policy. And in researching this, uh, it appears that this policy was derived from state government code section 65590, uh, which is known as the Mellow Act, which protects uh, affordable housing within the coastal zone up and down California. And the, the Mellow Act, um, yeah. So, so um, the planning division uh, went through a research exercise to determine exactly what, how does the Mellow Act apply, does it apply, and how does the project uh, comply with the general plan, uh, coastal affordable housing preservation policy? So that 3.3.2-2 parentheses two. Um, so as we state, the median income is the amount that divides the income distribution into two equal groups, so half above, half below. Uh, Ventura County's uh, what's known as the area median income, or the AMI, is determined by the California Department of housing and community development. And that's an annual report that is put out each year by that department. And so for 2016, the AMI for a four person household, that's their standard reporting number for Ventura County is $89,300 annually. Um, in this case, uh, per their report, moderate income is defined as 80% to 120% of the area median income. And so in determining whether uh, we were dealing with um, low or moderate income housing, we've established the upper limit of moderate income as $107,150 annually. So anything below that would be considered at least moderate, if not lower or very low income. Above that is high income. So that's the number where um, we're not gonna give the range on that because the upper limit is the one that matters most in this case. So the uh, Department of 
Housing and Community Development also provides an adjustment for single person households, which the planning division determined that each of the residents in the current structure, each is a single person household. And so that's a 70% um, adjustment to the four person uh, number established by the state. So in this case, uh, the AMI for a single person household, the upper limit of moderate income in Ventura County for 2016 is $75,000. So the planning division contacted each of the residents and uh, asked if they would provide any relevant income information that would allow us to determine whether they were low or moderate income. Uh, not all of them, as you can imagine, were willing to supply this information in exact ways. Uh, however, tenant one provided tax information to us uh, demonstrating that they own another home within Ventura County and another one out of the state. They reported to us that they liked living on, having a place immediately on the beach. And, uh, tenant two actually provided their uh, tax returns for 2015, or the previous year, and demonstrated that their annual gross income is greater than $75,000. So, and then tenant three elected not to provide any information to the planning staff, and as such is undetermined. May I, may I ask a question? Yeah, yes. Could you go back to that? Um, what is the difference between wealth owning properties and um, the income? Is there a, a guideline regarding uh, wealth or, or? The state did not provide an established guideline for uh, equating those two okay. topics. Okay. And uh, are you aware of whether they own these properties outright or whether they're mortgaged? The or? information they provided to us, that is correct, okay, that they you. own them. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to uh, the Mellow Act, uh, which is Government Code Section 65590. So the, request, the requirement for replacement of dwelling units shall not apply to the following types of conversion or demolition unless the local government determines the replacement of all or any portion is, um, of the converted or demolition, demolished units is feasible. So. So the conversion or demolition, and this is the first exception listed in the law, which is the conversion or demolition of a residential structure which contains less than three units or in the event that the proposed conversion or demolition involves more than one residential structure, uh, the conversion or demolition of 10 or fewer dwelling units. So the plan division determined that not all three of the residents were low or moderate income. And so therefore, um, less than three dwelling units occupied by low or moderate income would be demolished. So moving forward, the replacement unit shall be located on the site of the converted or dem dem demolished structure or elsewhere within the coastal zone if feasible, or they shall be located within three miles of the coastal zone. So the planning division you know, determined that even if the Mellow Act were to apply in this case and require replacement of the housing, where could you replace a similar structure for, of three dwelling units within three miles of the subject property? And the existing structure is a legal non-conforming structure and in the RBH zone. The RBH zone does not allow for multi-unit or greater than two unit housing uh, or structures. And so uh, to, replay, to replace the structure on site or within three miles of the coastal zone or within three miles of the subject property, uh, we surveyed the area within three miles for any properties properly zoned. There are two and they're currently occupied by multifamily structures. So replacement wouldn't even be feasible. So therefore, uh, the planning division's conclusion is the proposed project is in compliance with the requirements of the Mellow Act. So moving on to the general plan policy that we cited earlier, the 3.3.2-2 parentheses two. So the conclusion is that less than three dwelling units occupied by lower or moderate incomes would be demolished. So um, we assessed existing rental rates um, However, the rental rates of the property aren't controlled by law or any other. There's no rent control in the area. So the property owner could charge whatever they want for rent. So uh, low income people could have been priced out legally years ago if they existed there. Um, local governments may not mandate privately funded developers to include affordable housing units and rental projects, uh, which is Palmer Sixth Street Properties versus City of Los Angeles decided in 2009. Um, so even if we were to rebuild the structure and 
we would not be able to require the applicant to rent the property at less than market rate. And then the replacement on site with a similar multifamily dwelling unit, as we stated before, is infeasible based on the zoning and required a zone change uh, from the Board of Supervisors. So, so therefore, the proposed project is consistent with general plan policy that we've cited previously. So the appellant's second grounds of appeal was that the Ventura County Planning Division did not properly assess the potential impacts on uh, resources uh, that the project would have, and so specifically water resources, and that the Planning Division stated that uh, pursuant to the Ventura County Water Works Manual, the project would result in a net reduction of a ha what is referred to as a half connection of water. Under the Water Works Manual, um, uh, apartments or dwelling units within a structure are considered a half connection, so going from three to two units would reduce it by a half connection pursuant to the Water Works Manual. So the project wouldn't have a greater water demand on the Channel Islands Beach Community Services District, which has uh, already agreed to supply the proposed water to the project, and they're currently supplying water to the existing triplex. Uh, the City of Oxnard uh, will continue to provide sewage disposal service to the proposed project. Um, I already talked about the Water Works Manual. Um, and moving on to natural resources in the area, the proposed project wouldn't impact beach uh, vegetation or dune material because it would be conditioned that no parts of the construction or anything would be allowed to extend beyond the subject property. Um, and the proposed project wouldn't restrict uh, public access to the beach because it wouldn't interfere with the existing adjacent beach access way. So, and then emergency response, the Ventura County Fire Protection District found that the existing water supply and ocean drive are adequate to supply emergency services to the uh, subject property. So, um, the Planning Commission must make a number of findings in order to determine that the proposed project is consistent with the standards of the county zoning ordinance and the general plan. So, number one, the proposed development is consistent with the intent and provisions with the county's local coastal program. The planning division didn't find any inconsistencies uh, with the coastal program. Uh, number two, the proposed development is compatible with the character of the surrounding development. Uh, the proposed project is a residential structure substantially similar to other residential structures in that community. The proposed development, if a conditionally permitted use, is compatible with planned uses in the general area where the development is to be located. Uh, the project is not a conditionally permitted use, so number three does not apply. Or, uh, yes. um, the proposed pro a development would not be obnoxious or harmful or impair the utility of neighboring property or uses. Uh, it's a residential structure that would be substantially similar and have, you know, uh, would be a noise sensitive use rather than a noise generating use uh, similar to surrounding properties. And the proposed development would not be detrimental to the public interest, health, safety, convenience, or welfare. Uh, as we stated previously, the Ventura County uh, Fire Protection District determined that there's adequate emergency services to the area, and, um, at, and we've determined that there's adequate water and sewer to supply to the area that it wouldn't uh, default on any of those issues. So notice was provided of this hearing, uh, December 1st hearing, in the Ventura County Star and mailed to property owners within 300 feet of the subject property and residents within 100 feet of the subject property. So the appellants recommended actions in their appeal were to uh, properly evaluate the application and hold another hearing once such reevaluation has been completed or deny the application. So the additional evaluation by planning staff uh, and conducting the planning commission hearing today uh, fulfills the first request of the appellant and so therefore we believe that's been satisfied. So the staff recommendations are to one, certify that the planning commission has reviewed and considered the staff report and all exhibits and has considered all comments received during the public comment period process. We haven't received any public comments uh, in the public comment period other than the appellant's comments. So two, find that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA pursuant to the cited section and make the required Three, make the required findings to grant a P, uh, plan development permit uh, pursuant to eight, section 8181-3.5 of the county, of the coastal zoning ordinance uh, based on the substantial evidence presented today and in the staff report and documents you received. Four, grant the PD permit uh, subject to the provided conditions of approval. Five, deny the appellant's appeal. And six, specify that the clerk of the planning commission is the custodian of uh, the proceedings today. 
So, and with that, I'm open for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Before we have questions, I have disclosures by commissioners. So I will read the disclosure note. At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. I'll start to my left, Commissioner Rodriguez. Do you have any disclosures? Um, I was, uh, I'm familiar with the site. Um, I visited two or three days ago, <clears throat> excuse me, two or three days ago, just so I was clear as to what the property was. Um, I'm a uh, Channel Islands Beach resident as well. Uh, I too am familiar with the area. My brother lives in that area, and I did drive by the property but had no conversation with anyone. Thank you. I have no disclosures. I have no disclosures. And I have no disclosures. Moving on. We will open the public hearing, and uh, is there a presentation by the applicant? Uh, or to, or the, um, I'm sorry, because this is an appeal, what, um, we'll go the opposite way. It would be the appellant would go first, right? So in this case, um, is there a presentation by the appellant? I don't have any speaker cards. Okay, so, um, yeah, yeah. So being that there is no oral presentation by the appellant, um, I, ha I have no speaker cards. So does anyone want to speak on this matter? Then we'll skip ahead to uh, questions of, uh, of staff. Are there any questions of staff? Commissioner Rodriguez. Um, yeah, I, I guess I need some clarification. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you're not the architect, and we're just going off very rough drawings here. Um, and I have questions about, uh, about the actual structure. Um, Commissioner I, Rodriguez, the, the architect is in the room if you would like to have questions of the architect. Would love to. If he'd like to step up. Hello. Mr. Phillips. Yes. Uh, go ahead and identify yourself. Right and my name is Walt Phillip. I'm the designer of the property and also the uh, eventual contractor. Okay. Um, both structures are going to be approximately 5,684 feet, square feet? Total between the two units. There's two units, so they're divided. I, th I thought the literature said each unit was no. going to be. That was a major question, because I was looking at, uh, is that what you interpreted here? Uh, anyway, that was my interpretation of the report, so I apologize for that. I, I thought that was a little bit, little bit, uh, yeah. large for that size lot. Yes. Um, as it relates to this, the actual structure, um, are there parapet walls around the structure uh, this, on the roof? Uh, the top of the parapet is yeah. uh, within that 28 foot maximum height that's allowed for the RBH zone. Okay. And are there going to be, uh, I assume there's air conditioner or something on the, I see it elevated. Yeah, there are, there are air conditioning systems uh, throughout is, the uh, two units. Is that structure uh, extend beyond the roof line but below the parapet line? Uh, no, it doesn't. It's off of the uh, third and second floor uh, deck areas. There are two heat pumps, and each of them are located on 
right. uh, and accessible from each unit's second and third floor uh, roof decks. Okay. Um, I saw a, uh, a it looked like a uh, aerial of, of the roof. Are those mm -hmm. skylights? Skylights, exactly. Okay. And you probably have chimney stacks that and, will and, extend above and, the 28 feet. And the chimney, right. Yeah. Um, and that would be on 3285, the proposed 3285 res residence? Yeah, for each residence of the duplex. Oh, each one, okay. Um, what is the inside ceiling height of, those stru of that structure? Uh, I believe it's uh, eight feet on the first floor, or close to nine feet on the I'm second floor, to, uh, and eight feet on the upper what, floor. What's, what's the maximum interior height on the third floor? I believe it's just under eight feet. And how does that relate to the ground floor total distance? Since, well, since, this, since the code, as I understand it, was changed and, and you have a maximum exterior elevation of 28 feet, mm -hmm. but as I recall reading, you're limited to no more than 25 feet on the inside. Yeah, do, do we have the building sections that I prepared? And, and less, unless it's an open, to, to eliminate any sort of uh, other floor space above, up there. Um, as in like a loft or something. Yeah, there's no loft. There's okay. no way. Yeah, I didn't see that, but no. I was just curious. But. Yeah. Okay. Um, so are these going to be apartments or condos? Uh, it's a duplex. Okay. So so it'll be a one, one owner, two apartment duplex. Yes, I, I'm will. sure there's a potential that someone could split it into two condos, but okay. that's not discussed at the moment. Okay. It's not a, okay. Um... Since you're going to be the contractor, I'm curious to know how you're going to handle handle the construction and the traffic, and et cetera, et cetera. We do. I've been, I've been building at the beach since '74, so it's uh, yeah, <laughs> it's something long, that uh, yeah. we know how to keep the neighbors happy and deal with yeah. the traffic and the trash and everything. Yeah, I've been there longer than that, and I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. It's it's I see a problem, obviously, with with the construction vehicles. Uh, um, that are on prem or will be on prem. How are you can accommodate those uh, um, without having a significant impact on neighbors? Well, there's just small crews. We don't. It's not like you're building on five acres where you can have all the different trades show up. So we just take the foundation at one point, the framing at the next, and so on and so on. I can't load up the whole house with all the different uh, uh, subcontractors. Okay. No, I understand that. But I've gone through through construction down. Yeah, the but beach. yeah, but what what we do, you know, there obviously the beach is getting pretty well built out. And in the past, in 70, 74, 77, 80s, you know, we had all the space to park in front of an empty lot, and that's not available now. So we, we, I introduced myself to all the neighbors, and if we do park uh, partially in front of a home, we don't obstruct the access to their driveway, and that's how we work it out. Just, it's just got to, we just had to work with the neighbors. That's what we do. Um. I also have a question about hours of construction and activity on the site. Um, the, the standard, I think, was the word that was used in, the te in our report, uh, it identifies Monday through Friday 7 to 7, and Saturday and Sunday plus holidays uh, 7 to, excuse me, 9 to 7. Commissioner Rodriguez, that's correct. I, I have a problem uh, with the 7 o'clock uh, evening time, uh, actually with the 7 o'clock in the morning, um, um, and I've, I've, I've done construction down there, and I have ongoing construction right next door to me, mm -hmm. and I understand, understand the 7 o'clock startup time uh, to pound nails, but uh, people have some expectation of, of privacy, the opportunity, opportunity to not be disturbed at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and so the preparation that goes on in my most recent experience, for example, is, is uh, uh, dragging, dragging lumber and, and, and ladders uh, uh, 
slamming them against the pavement or, or whatever before, you know, during that seven o'clock will be witching hour so they can start pounding nails as soon as possible. Um, as a contractor, I'm assuming uh, your concern for the neighbors, cooperation, et cetera, includes trying to minimize that to some degree that's, in, that's possible for you and not start pounding at 7 o'clock and start well, that. Well, you know, the crews show up at 7 o'clock, open the gates, and then they proceed to do what they're expected to do that day. We don't go till 7 o'clock in the evenings. And on weekends, you know, everybody puts in their 40 hours, so nobody really wants to pay time and a half and work, you know, over the weekends. But on weekends, I'll have a cr cleanup crew coming, and we'll clean up the trash, clean up the lumber uh, 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 pieces or whatever to keep, keep the site. Uh, presentable. I know there's been a number of situations down at the beach where certain contractors have not done that, and there was a big uh, 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 problem. I think the planning commission was brought into it, and uh, uh, but we're super careful. Every every Saturday, I have someone there to clean the project up. When we we maintain the streets, you know, I have a project going at 4133 Ocean Drive, and the uh, uh, neighbors come up and say, "I can't believe you're you're sweeping our streets." <laughs> and we are, you know, we go right. out there, and even though yeah. the, the Channel Islands Water District did a repair where they had opened up the asphalt and uh, uh, extend the uh, uh, new water line over where the meter location is, uh, they asphalted the street, but there's all these little pieces of asphalt chips all over the place, and we just, I had a crew over there, and sure. we just uh, swept it up and kept it clean. But, but be, be, I, I feel like I'm invading the neighbor's property, and because I'm right so close to them, so I'm over careful. Right. I contact the neighbors. I make sure that everybody's happy. I go and look over their fence every day to make sure there isn't nails or lumber in the, in the side yard. So we're just super careful to make sure nobody's upset with us. Yeah, I can't, I can't deal with all the situations about noise and all during the construction uh, time that we have between 7 and, say, 5 o'clock, but uh, we're really careful about that. So, it's not, so I, I also, thank you. I also understand you saying that uh, you have no intention of working um, Toward the seven o'clock hour no. in the evening when people are normally arriving and sitting down to dinner. No, no. Um, okay, that was a, again that was a concern of mine. There's there's a lot of contractors out there, um, both union and non-union, and and uh, there's a lot of contractors out there that come out on weekends uh, from their regular job to do a quick job on somebody yeah. else's property, um, and they get it done. Try to get it done before they get back to work. They're a real job on Monday, <laughs> and so. That would be a concern of mine. Certainly, it's a concern uh, for the appellant as far as the noise, uh, the construction noise, and yeah. that type of issue. Part have of you spoken to the appellant? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, but one thing we do have, we have a sign that it's required that we put up on the uh, fence saying that there's any complaints where my name and contact information is on the sign. Right, I saw that on our report. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. That's one of the questions I have. But one thing I did do with the appellant, I did write him a letter to explain how I run a project. I never uh, received a response from him. So I did try to reach out and uh, contact him, but uh, I did not receive a response. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of the speaker? Thank you very much. Uh, are there any closing comments by staff? Any, any follow-up? Trying to make eye contact. Okay, uh, then I will close the public hearing and we will start deliberation. I'd move for recommended staff action. I second the motion. Thank you very much. We're going to take uh, how long of a break do you need? We're going to take. Okay, thank you. So now uh, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is PL 15-0158 a conditional use permit for the construction and use of a 64-bed residential care facility. Welcome back. Good morning. 
once again, for the record, I'm still Matt Sauter with the Ventura County <laughs> Planning Division. So I'm the case planner also for um, uh, conditional use permit application PL150158 for a 64 bed uh, residential care facility or assisted living facility. Matt, usually you're expected to provide some music while we okay. wait. Well, I don't think we need to hear me singing. I, <laughs> I, I, there, that would be immediately appealed. So. <laughs> okay, um, so the project is, there we go. Um, this is not the right one. Um, at any rate, the project is proposed to be located in the Myers Oaks uh, community uh, just west of Highway 33 on El Robar Road. Um, so, uh, the project site uh, was created uh, as the subject of a 10 lot subdivision, I believe, in September of 1989, which created nine residential uh, lots and one commercially zoned or commercial plan development uh, lot, which is the subject property that sits immediately upon El Robar. Uh, the remaining residential properties were to the south um, along Stockbridge Lane. So, um, if you excuse me. Right, as we stated previously, it, the project is located in the Miners Oaks area. Uh, is this commercial planned uh, development uh, zoned lot here. So the subject property located here uh, is immediately adjacent to a church, uh, some mixed use residential commercial development, uh, residential development and a vacant lot to the north and houses and residences on the west and south along Stockbridge and Canterbury Court. So the zoning on the site is commercial plan development. As I previously stated, it was uh, recorded as track map uh, 3145 in 1989. Um, the general plan designation is existing community. And the Ojai, we are located within the, Ojai, the boundaries of the Ojai Valley area plan. And the designation there is commercial. This is a view of the current, current view of the subject property that it is essentially a vacant lot. Um, looking from El Roblar uh, southwest to the project site and from El Roblar southeast to the project site. Uh, next door neighbors are the Ohio Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, this is the home on um, Stockbridge Lane immediately to the south. Uh, here you can see, um, note this uh, open space here, which is an access easement that runs to the south side of the subject property. And then this is residence to the north of the site across El Roblar. So as previously stated, the uh, subject property achieved its current configuration and it was, sorry, my mistake, 1985 uh, recorded then. Uh, nine residential lots, one commercial lot, and then in, approved in 1989 was a conditional use permit, uh, LU1285A, which is a conditional use permit for what was to be known as the Miners Oaks Village Shopping Center. Uh, this would have been a small shopping center that would have constituted five buildings, totaling uh, about 18 and a half thousand square feet, parking for 100 vehicles. However, this was never constructed. A number of extensions to the zoning clearance to effectuate this permit were granted, but finally, um, it was decided that those ex those exemptions and extensions would no longer be given, and that permit expired. So, initially permitted, but never constructed. So today's request is to construct and operate and maintain an assisted living facility uh, that would be co composed of four residential structures of seven, uh, 7,800 square feet apiece, which would include 14 studio units, which would be 379 square feet apiece, and two one-bedroom units uh, of 750 square feet apiece. And this is within each of the four residential structures. So 
14 plus two equals 16 times four. That gets us to our 60, proposed 64 units. So, and there would also be a fifth 600 square foot building that would be the office structure that would include the reception, uh, all entry to the pro property would be through that, um, the facility director and sales office, a multi-purpose lounge and a wellness center. And it should be noted that the core of each of the residential structures would include a common area that would include a living room, dining room, open kitchen, a salon slash spa and a library as proposed. The exterior parts of the uh, proposed conditional use permit would be to allow for a barbecue area, gardens, walking paths, a swimming pool and spa, and a 32 pa space parking lot. Uh, water service is proposed to be provided directly by the Miners Oaks Water District who receives backup water when their wells run dry from the Casitas Municipal Water District. Sewer service is, will be provided by the Ojai Valley Sanitary District and access to the site would be off of El Roblar Drive on the north end of the property via a 20 foot wide dri driveway. So this is a proposed site plan. Um, this, these are just kind of an outline of the individual. Uh, each, these, this is residential structure one, two, three, and four with the office structure as pulled out here, uh, located right there. And this is a schematic of each of the residential structures. Uh, the barbecue area would be here, uh, pool here, uh, walking paths along the outside, um, El Roblar on the north, and then the access point here. Um, as you know, trash enclosures would be located up here on this side, away from any of the surrounding residences. And then on the southeast side of the property, there is a gate here, which is um, connected to that access easement we spoke of earlier. That emergency access easement was recorded in track map 3145 across that property, the residential property to the, to the south. So um, along with that, there is a uh, sanit 11 foot wide uh, sanitation easement that extends south here uh, across the, that property to Stockbridge Lane. So this access would be for emergency access only and gate controlled along with a Knox box that the fire department would have control of. So no residents, visitors, employees, deliveries, uh, access to the site would be provided by this location via Stockbridge Lane. Everything would come in from El Roblar Drive and this would only be used in case of emergency that if access was deemed necessary by emergency responders. These are the proposed elevations. Um, as you can see, the project would be constructed in what I guess is termed an Andalusian Spanish style in concert with the Ojai Valley Hospital um, and the Acacia Manor in Miners Oaks. So, and this is a view from the parking lot. And so you can see residential structure, residential structure, access point to the uh, facility via the main office here in the center. So this is the uh, conceptual landscape plan proposed for the site. There is a single coast live oak tree present on the existing property that would be removed as part of construction, but mitigation for that would be replacement with two new specimen live oak trees as part of the landscape design. Uh, the landscaping would also be supplied, all of its irrigation water would be supplied via a gray water system proposed for the site that would take sink kitchen water that isn't black water uh, to supply all of the water for the, uh, the plants as proposed. So the environmental review of the project, um, uh, the planning division completed an initial study and determined that there would be potentially significant impacts to water resources and surface and groundwater quantity and supply. And so pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15070, a uh, mitigated negative declaration was prepared. Um, that identifies project-specific impacts to water resources and uh, proposed mitigation measures that the applicant has agreed to to mitigate those potential impacts to less than significant levels. So specifically, the general plan policy state uh, 1.3.2.4 states, discretionary development shall not significantly impact the quantity or quality of water resources within watersheds, groundwater recharge areas, or groundwater basins. And then more specifically, going from the general plan to the area plan, the Ojai Valley area plan has a specific policy related to water demand within the area plan boundaries, which states that new discretionary development shall be required to retrofit existing plumbing fixtures or provide other means so as not to add any 
net increased demand on the existing water supply. This policy shall be applicable until such time as a groundwater basin study is completed and it is found that the available groundwater or other such sources of water could adequately provide for cumulative demand without creating an overdraft situation. <clears throat> so the key phrase here is any net increased demand on existing water supply. <coughs> the planning division worked with the Watershed Protection District to come up with an estimated uh, water demand that the project would require and that is approximately 6.4 acre feet per year. Moving forward, working with the Watershed Protection District, the Planning Division uh, created um, the proposed mitigation measure, which we're referring to as the Water Offset Plan, that the, the goal of which is to ensure that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the project would comply with that Ojai Valley Area Plan policy to prevent any new net increased demand of water. And so how that would uh, work is the uh, mitigation measure and condition would um, if your commission were to approve the project, the next step would be for the planning division uh, to address or the applicant to address a number of prior to zoning clearance conditions so before they would be allowed to construct the project. So the planning division would require the applicant to submit an exact count of how much water they would be uh, using as based on their building plans and you know fixture counts that so we have an exact number of their total water demand you know factoring in their gray water system and their underground um, stormwater uh, recharge system so and that would occur prior to issuing a zoning clearance for construction and then it would be incumbent upon the applicant to then uh, go out and find whether to retrofit plumbing in the surrounding area. <coughs> if you'll excuse me one moment. And so it would be incumbent upon the applicant to go out and uh, make agreements as needed to retrofit plumbing to or take water services out of use, you know, by, um, you know, turf replacement in some locations or, uh, just forgot less. And so retrofitting turf replacement or taking agricultural uses out of production, it's, and to add up to the, um, to offset the total water demand of the project. Excuse Once me, sir. Yes. How does the county verify the plan? Uh, that whatever measures are taken will equal that quantity? So they're going to have to, um, moving forward, uh, once we have the plan, uh, prior to issuing a zoning clearance for use inauguration, they will have to submit a report detailing exactly what they did and how it fully offsets the de previously determined total water demand of the project. So that's to plumbing fixture by plumbing fixture by whatever? That'd be correct. So any means that they can come up with. They'll have to document it and provide information to the planning uh, division and the watershed production district satisfaction. So those two county agencies will review what they submit. Now is that, is that area confined to the Miners Oaks Water District? Uh, initially we had, um, we would like to see it confined to the Miners mm -hmm. Oaks uh, Water District. Um, However, if you look at the groundwater, it, they are within the Upper Ventura River groundwater basin. And so it would be hoped that any imp, you know, reduction within the basin would positively affect uh, water demand in the Miners Oaks area. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Following up on, on that a little bit, how does um, the pool fit in to, um, I noticed that there's a pool in the plan uh, and you're talking about replacing plumbing fixtures. Is that uh, uh, closing another pool? Would that offset or are pools figured into that um, equation at all? Uh, Chair Dukas, uh, they would be allowed to, you know, if they were to take a pool out of service, that would be the net benefit of the use of that pool would count against mm -hmm. their uh, negative water balance. Yes. Okay. So, and then moving on to the conditional use permit findings that the planning divisions made. Um, <clears throat> number one, the proposed development is consistent with the intent provisions of the county's general plan. 
and included in that is the area plan, uh, the OHAD value area plan. So based on the information that is out analysis presented in the staff report provided to you and today, the whole of the record, um, the planning division uh, finds that the proposed development is consistent with the intent and provisions of the general plan and the county ordinance. And so uh, the planning division did not find any inconsistencies between with the implementation of the mitigation measure for the water offset plan, any consistencies between the proposed project and the general plan and Ohio Valley area plan. <clears throat> Number two, the proposed development is compatible with the character of the surrounding legally established development. So the Myers Oaks community uh, is characterized by a diverse range of architectural styles that date back to the 1930s and, um, and it is largely built out with other residential uses with mixed commercial development throughout. Um, and so the proposed campus or residential care facility would be constructed in, as we stated, the Andalusian Spanish style, which would match the Ojai Valley Inn, the community hospital, and the nearby Acacia man Mansion in Miners Oaks. And to a certain extent, the Ace Hardware down the street in El Roblar, which also has a faux bell tower and tiling on its roof. So based on the, the above discussion, plan division, can we recommend that you can make this finding? Uh, number three, the proposed development would not be obnoxious or harmful or impair the utility of neighboring property uses. So the proposed project would, would not adversely impact air quality in the vicinity of the project. It would not be unsightly or visually incompatible with the neighborhood in that, you know, in the midst of the eclectic architectural styles of Miners Oaks, that Andalusian Spanish style is present um, and would not create noise impacts that would impact surrounding noise sensitive uses such as the single family dwellings or a church in that in spite of it being a commercially permitted use, it is technically a noise sensitive use rather than a noise generating use in this case. So no aspect of the project has been identified that would be obnoxious or harmful or affect the use of the neighboring properties before this finding can be made. <coughs> Uh, number four, the proposed development would not be detrimental to the public interest, health, safety, and convenience. So the proposed project would not adversely affect local air quality, would not adversely impact water supply through implementation of the water supply offset plan, and would not restrict or impair emergency response in the minor, Miners Oaks community. So, and then um, no as aspect of the project has been identified that would be detrimental to the public interest or pose a threat to the public health and safety. So. Therefore, this finding can be made. Number five, the proposed development, if allowed by a conditional use permit, as this is, is compatible with existing and potential land uses in the general area where the development is to be located. So as we stated previously, the Myers Oaks community has a diverse range of architectural styles and uses, particularly along El Roblar Drive. Um, <coughs> and the area is largely built out with other residential uses, and so a change in land use in the vicinity is unlikely to occur that we couldn't anticipate now. So therefore, this finding can be made. And finally, number six, the proposed development will occur on a legal lot. The, as stated before, the proposed project is located on a legal lot created by track number, the recordation of tract uh, 3154 in 1985. So this finding can be made. So public notification. Uh, as we stated previously, um, when the project was deemed to require a mitigated negative declaration, that requires a public review period for the environmental document. Uh, property owners within 300 feet of the, uh, the subject property were notified, along with uh, posting in the Ventura County Star and here at the Government Center that the MND and initial study were available for review and comment. Um, that period was between October 12th of this year and November 1st of this year. Also, this project was presented to the Ojai Valley Municipal Advisory Committee on October 17th, and that uh, committee voted four to one to recommend approval of the proposed project. So we've received a number of public comments, uh, both with, uh, mostly within the environmental comment period. So a summary of those comments, we've provided them in full, um, but the summary is uh, with regard to water resources, this is the most common one. Water resources are too scarce in Miners Oaks to permit the construction of a facility that would use this much water. Uh, I believe every one of our public comments asked this question. And so plan's response is the full uh, implementation of the water offset plan would ensure that the proposed project would not result in an increased water demand by offsetting the water it would require to operate. So uh, with regard to the access easement, would the fire access easement be used constantly as second access point for the proposed project? Plan's response is no, 
that access point on the southeast side of the property would be secured by a gate and a knox box that would be under control of the fire department so that uh, access point would only be for the use of for emergencies uh, residents visitors employees as stated before and deliveries would arrive via a row bar drive on the north end of the property and not via stockbridge lane to that southern access easement <clears throat> We've received some comments about uh, the proposed project adversely affecting uh, traffic in the Myers Oaks area. The, uh, a traffic study was prepared for um, uh, the applicants that did not find that the proposed project would significantly impact traffic in the Myers Oaks area as reviewed by the Transportation Division. Uh, the proposed project would be conditioned to restrict employee shift changes in order to ensure that the project does not add any peak hour trips in any direction during Highway 33 related to um, employees commuting to and from the site. Uh, with regard to noise, uh, the proposed project may adversely impact neighboring properties with noise. Um, the proposed project, as stated before, is not a noise generating use and shares more in common with the surrounding residential uses um, from a noise perspective than a commercial use as consistent with its zoning. So with regard to today's public hearing, notice was published uh, in the Ventura County Star and mailed to property owners within 300 feet. And this, finally, the staff recommended actions is to one, certify that the Planning Commission has reviewed and considered the staff report and all exhibits, including the proposed MND and mitigation measure, uh, and has considered all comments received during the public comment process. Two, find based on the whole of the record before the Planning Commission, including the initial study and any comments received, that upon implementation of the mitigation measures, there would be no substantial evidence that the project would have a significant effect on the environment and that the MND reflects the Planning Commission's independent judgment and analysis. Three, adopt the MND and the mitigation monitoring program. Four, make the required findings to grant the conditional use permit pursuant to section 8111-1.2.1.1 of the Ventura County Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance based on the substantial evidence presented in the staff report and the entire record. Five, grant conditional use permit PL150158 subject to the, its conditions of approval. And six, specify that the clerk of the planning division is the custodian um, and the government signs the location of the documents and materials that constitute the record of the proceedings upon which this decision would be made. Thank you. And I am open to any questions you may have. Before we have questions, we have to have disclosures. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, again, um, at this time, I'd like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. I'll start to my right, Commissioner Kelly. I have no ex parte communication regarding this case, but I did drive past the site yesterday around 4.30 p.m. Um, it was uh, minimal traffic. I didn't see very many cars as far as the traffic situation. But as I um, drove past the property, I did go past a, um, a real estate sign, and, that, um, and I recognized the face on there as an acquaintance of mine. Um, other than that, the property appears as, as in these photos. I did not go around to Stockbridge Lane or assess anything from that direction. But um, I didn't actually see a tree, but I wasn't really looking. I kind of went to the other side of the, uh, of the property towards the uh, church because I was driving in that direction. And, um, and I, otherwise, it's pretty much as it's, as it's pictured in the... Uh, in the diagrams there, but thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Onstock? I have no disclosures. Commissioner, I'm, I'm going to mess up your name. Kessley. Kessley. I always say Kelsey. That's close. I'll answer it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, my only disclosure is that I did drive by the property on a weekend, and I only drove by it off of uh, Roblar. Commissioner Rodriguez? No disclosures. And I have no disclosures. Are there any questions of staff at this time? Yes. Commissioner Onstott. Well, normally I'd wait till the conclusion where we'd, uh, of the presentations, but I'm informed that there may be some representatives of staff that have to go other places, so uh, I will go forward with the questions that I have. You know, my just a quick summary. My we've got a 64-unit 
project, 1.93 acres, five buildings, four residential landscaping swimming pool. My concerns primarily are with water. Now, I understand the water is provided by Minor, Minor Oaks Water District. And we're, we're told that with the mitigation measures, which include the retrofitting of plumbing fixtures in and around the area, that there will be no net in, new increase in water use. And I find that challenging, to say the least. Miners Oaks Water District, as I'm informed, has five wells, all of which are dry. And they get their water now from Casitas Mutual Water, which is from the lake. I'm informed that the lake is down 40%, looking at down 30% next year. I'm also informed that the, both Casitas and Miners Oaks have declared stage three drought, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, will call for an additional 30% a decrease in use by the people served by the water district and maybe beyond, I don't know. Is there an ongoing water study for the upper basin or the Ventura River Basin? I, uh, Commissioner Ansa, I don't no, if we need, if somebody else is here and can chime in, we can expedite or come on up and just introduce yourself because I'm going, I've got several questions. Okay. Good uh, morning, sir. Good morning, Madam uh, Chair and uh, Commissioners. I'm Kim Loeb, Groundwater Manager with the Ventura County Watershed Protection District. Um, so I was uh, called in to uh, answer your questions this morning. I, I will tell you that uh, I don't have firsthand knowledge of this project. Uh, the groundwater specialist that did work on this is on a, uh, a medical leave right now. But uh, in terms of the, uh, some of the general concepts and uh, the procedures that we would take in reviewing a water plan, I can answer. I can also answer your question that um, right now there is under Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, there is a groundwater sustainability agency forming for the upper Ventura River Basin. It's not formed, but they are forming. This is a medium priority basin as identified by the California Department of Water Resources, which means that they're required to have a groundwater sustainability plan submitted by 2022. Now they can do that before that, but at this point the, the sustainability agency is still in the formation period. Um, other than that, I'm not aware of any specific basin-wide plan. Okay, so there's no sustained yield determination at this point in time. Is that correct? As far as I know, I'm not, um, I'm fairly... As far as you know, sir. As far as, yeah. Um, and I don't know what, uh, Miners Oaks would have a uh, urban water management plan for their water management, and there may be other uh, plans like that, uh, but um, I don't have the details of that. Well, what I'm troubled by is the fact that we are obviously in a drought that's having significant impacts all over this county and Southern California. And I understand and appreciate what's going on. I don't understand, I mean, normally if someone came in for residential development in the county of Ventura, they'd have to have a will serve letter from some purveyor. And, I'm not, and I've never seen a conditional will serve letter and the will serve letter that's cited in our documents dated, what, August 30th, specifically says it's not a will serve letter. And then there's a provision on page 109 of our staff documents dealing with this conditional will serve letter and ending with, therefore, the proposed project is considered to have a permanent supply of water. Well, that's a real reach. We've got a conditional will serve letter that says it's not a will serve letter. We've got a water company that has no water, that gets water from another water company that's in, I won't say overdraft, but is, and all the water, in my understanding, that's in Lake Casitas is appropriated. So there's no new water to be divvied out to any new applicant. Is that right, you said? No, you may not, but you can come up later. Um, so I have a real problem adopting a, a negative deck. I really do. 
unless you have the cooperation of Mother Nature, which I don't think you'll ever get, we ha we're in a drought. There's no, and no foreseeable that I've been able to determine reason to believe that drought will change and that water usage will continue and the amount of available reserves will continue to go down. I guess I have a trouble, I have trouble issuing any kind of zoning clearance in this kind of situation at all. I would, I don't understand why the County of Ventura didn't require a standard will serve letter instead of going through all these gyrations, which to me, while it's just an unduly complicated and messy and will not result in a determination that there's sufficient water. I have, you know, and maybe I'm just talking off the cuff here, but the groundwater issue, the surface water issue, and the water quality issue are not resolved in any regard as far as I'm concerned. And I don't see how the County of Ventura can issue a zoning clearance under these facts. And I guess that's could more you, argument than it is question. Yeah, but could, you, could you answer that question? <laughs> Because well, we're, we're at questions now. Well, the it. problem is we've got a will serve letter that isn't a will serve letter. We, uh, we don't know the amount of water that will be required. We, we, we don't know whether they'll be able to meet the situation. I'm, I'm wondering so, why we're even at this point. Why aren't we just telling the applicant to obtain a will serve letter that isn't conditional? Just, 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 for, just for the sake of following our process. Okay. Do you have a question? Could you, could you restate that as a question? I don't see how what the county's proposing here can result in a result that will be, make the water issue less than significant. Therefore, I can't see how we can do a negative deck. And quite frankly, I think they need a focused EIR on water alone. Okay, so I'll direct that to um, county council then uh, for your response because we are in questions and we are gonna go through the process of, of having a fair hearing. Well, I, I know there was a lot of comment in there, but we have but, a gentleman that has to leave, and I want to so, make sure that he understands my concerns. Um, if I may, uh, uh, Commissioner Onstott, we do see uh, conditional will serve letters are not unusual. We, we do see those. Um, the conditions have to be met. Um, and so, uh, especially these days, we see a lot of, uh, that, that's not a, an unusual thing to see a conditional will serve letter. So I, I just wanted to state that. I, I have not seen this specific one because as I stated, I, I, unfortunately I've not been personally involved in this project. Well, it just seems to me with ever decreasing amounts of water, unless there's a change, a climactic change, that that level of water is going to drop, drop, drop. And those people and then Miners Oaks in the immediate area and the people that take water out of that basin are going to be adversely affected by this project. And that's my opinion. And I haven't heard anything or seen anything to the contrary. Yes, sir, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, I, your concerns are, um, I understand your concerns and I'm sure a lot of other people will speak to them. Just conceptually from a CEQA point of view, um, what staff has brought forward is um, a mitigation measure, you know, as, as Matt described, that would um, offset the water usage of this project by basically taking other wa water usage offline. And so the concept is that other water usage would have to be taken offline before this project could go online. And so, um, so the, the concept, again, is that that mitigation measure would reduce the significance of uh, water impact to a level of less than significant. Um, and it, it's up to your uh, commission to ultimately decide whether or not you think that's feasible. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's up to you, but that's the concept. Fo following up on that, how would that mitigation measure be monitored other than, you know, a paper report? Uh, I'll, I'll let staff address that. How would that mitigation measure be monitored? So let me just chime in here for a second. So I think that we should turn our attention to, to uh, the mitigation plan itself. It's the water offset plan. It's condition 26 right. of, of um, exhibit five. And so this is, I think, the, the questions um, that you were trying to get at for, for Kim here to saying, how, how can we be assured? And to me, in looking at the plan and, and, and working with Alma, who is not here today, it's a math exercise, right? You have to go in and replace. They have to replace before they can get their occupancy, 
replace toilets and urinals and sinks and, and other things that aren't, you know, that aren't water efficient with water efficient. And the plan lays it out very specifically, you know, the math that it can be, 1.28, you know. And so they have to come up with this six acre feet, 5,800 gallons a day. They have to come up with a math showing what they replace, going into an elementary school, replacing 200 toilets, going you know, to the high school, doing whatever that they need to do. They need to come up with a plan. It's a, it's a no uh, net increase of water because the policy says that it can't be. And so therefore they have to go and do that work. So it is no new water. And so the conditional when we get conditional water letters, right, those are unusual to us. We spent a lot of time, I'm sure the applicants can tell you, with the water districts, with the watershed protection districts, really going through this exercise of understanding how we can be assured that it will be no net water. It's a general plan policy, right? We take that very seriously. But I think that if you're looking at these, these kitchen faucets, these res, uh, residential faucets, you know, not to exceed 1.2 gallons per minute flow rate, not to exceed 0.2.2, I mean, the math is there and we just simply have to come up with the math the applicant does this is all on the applicant before they can operate that facility so. I understand what you're saying as difficult as that is but in a falling amount of water available okay is it are they going to have what happens after they meet the initial criteria we have a plan we have 6.4 acre feet of water solely available you give them the zoning clearance the water level continues to drop all of those people in that that water company or water district or that take water out of that basin are going to be adversely affected by this project because there's going to be less for them. Until, unless you can prop up the other end and tell me that there'll be adequate water, that that number will not continue to decrease because of the drought, I have a real problem with this. I'm I understand what you're saying, and I, I understand, okay? I understand. But given the drought and the situation exists beyond this particular rec uh, plan, I don't see how you can get there. I'm not sure how we can't get there because it's a no net, uh, it's, a, it's a zero net, right? So the water isn't going to go any lower because of this project because it's going to be, the, the other projects are going to be using less water. Otherwise, if we say we can't do it at all, then, then we're in a moratorium situation, right? That's right, you right? are. And, and, and so we're not. Well, right? you should not, be. Not right now. And so I think, I think that the exercise should be going through and, 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 and asking him if you have questions for them, you know, can it be done? He's, he's the expert here in the room and, and to me, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a math exercise that we spend a lot of time with the, with the water companies putting no, together. I, I understand completely what you're saying about the math exercise and if they in fact came up with a 6.4, but it's, the question goes beyond that. Okay, uh, we have another question, Commissioner Kessler. Kesley? So my question is simply, understanding that this is somewhat a change of use, correct? Um, there's going to be an increase in water because it's going from a commercial to more of a residential type property, and we're doing that with a conditional use permit. Is that correct? Am I stating that correctly? Because it, it was going to be a shopping center. Um, that's what it's zoned for, commercial, and this is more of a residential use. Um, this is it's functionally similar to a residential use. Oh, sorry. So there uh, is going to be an increase in water usage because it is more or less a residential component now as opposed to a commercial component. Then Correct. what we previously assessed in the 80s. Right. So there was a there, However, was, a, there, there was a net increase based on the what was previously proposed and what's being proposed. I think it was but, a small amount. Correct. Um, that's like that's correct. Yeah, Although no. the the uh, the MND or the ND yes. um, analyzes it at zero, yes. so it doesn't even take that two acre feet into consideration. I, and I do understand that. Okay. I'm just kind of getting to a point. So understanding that, and, and I'm always very sensitive to when you're changing um, something, a use uh, per se. So once they do uh, mitigate the issue, and we're at a, a net zero, later on, a year from now. Um, when flow restrictors go bad and things happen to the property, is there a compliance? Um, does the county have some sort of mechanism to ensure there's compliance ongoing so that this property doesn't then again start to use more water and now there is an increase? Uh, the condition as written does not include ongoing compliance. The initial uh, study and offset is what is currently required. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm gonna open the public hearing and we'll have uh, the people who are in favor of the, uh, thank you very much for coming up and answering you, our sir. questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna call people in favor and then people opposed. So the first speaker will be Michael Weyrick. Make sure that you have a uh, speaker card submitted if you want to speak. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Weirich, uh, 3911 North Ventura Avenue. Um, I uh, represent W&J Investments. We're the applicant. I um, want to thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners, and also thank staff for their long and arduous process that we've gone through. Um, probably right off the bat, I should address water, since, since that's the issue. Uh, regarding the conditional um, will serve letter, uh, the condition on that is us paying a fee. And so um, we have a, 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 water, a will serve letter from Miners Oaks Water District. We also have a will serve letter from Casitas Water District. Um, we also had an updated um, water study done by Miners Oaks updating their water manual that showed that they had a permanent supply of water for the project. Uh, but we are sensitive. We are, we are in a drought situation and we're sensitive to that. Um, one of the things, though, that is required with the Ojai Valley um, specific plan is that we don't use any water. Um, to, and to get to your point, the, we have already an allocation of 2.6, of almost 2.7 acre feet of water per year to the project. We have five water meters plus an irrigation meter. But the Ojai Valley specific plan makes us reduce that to zero, doesn't even include our allocation that we already have on the project. So what we have done, we've already met with the Ojai Valley School District to work with them, and because they have many, many old fixtures. It's you know, most of the schools other than Nordoff are quite old. Um, and working with them to um, upgrade their uh, fixtures within the school and also to help them with their turf removal process. So the turf removal process is um, a big water saving process because once that turf is out of service, then it's, you know, it's not like they just turn the sprinklers back on. We would, you know, retrofit that with dry scaping, et cetera. Uh, and the six and where are you doing that? At schools? At schools, yeah. We're working with the Ojai Valley School. We felt like we're not limited to that, but we felt like that was the best public benefit because we'll be helping the school district reduce their water usage, their water bills, et cetera, from um, our, our work that's at our expense uh, for, a public, for a public benefit through the uh, area. Um, the other thing is the 6.4 acre feet, that is a number that was determined by the Casitas Water District based on usage from properties in Santa Barbara. Uh, that many of those are large turfed areas, you know, lush gardens, and they look at their actual meter use. What we'll be doing is we've already engaged our water engineer that will do a study of our, own, our, our specific water use based on, of course, new standards of flow, low flow toilets, low flow shower heads, et cetera. Uh, also with our um, landscaping is uh, low water landscaping and we are installing a state-of-the-art gray water system so that we will reuse domestic water, not obviously not toilet water, but waters from kitchen, uh, not kitchen sinks, bathroom you know, basins, um, showers, et cetera. It goes through a filtering process. It's held underground in a tank, and then that is utilized as a pump to do all of our landscape watering. One other thing that we are in our plan is rather than draining into the uh, storm drain system is we're installing a groundwater recharge system within our project. So any water runoff from rain, et cetera, goes underground into a, into a storage area that then is leaches into the gr groundwater system to help um, recharge the groundwater. Um, but I think from, from the, the questions that we have is, hey, where, you know, where are we in, in the water? I mean, we, as staff pointed out, you know, we spent a lot of time on this um, and met with both the o uh, Miners Oaks Water District and with the Casitas Water District, 
and they have assured us that they have the adequate water if we didn't have a zero net water uh, requirement. But the, I, I think looking forward, um, Commissioner Onstad is, is correct that we, we don't know exactly um, what, what the water situation will be, although the, the water districts tell us, hey, this is a normal cycle that they plan for uh, on an ongoing basis and that California, especially Southern California, goes through these ups and downs in water and that they are not uh, in, in necessarily un, unusual or unanticipated cycle. But we do have to be you know, look at conservation matters. And we have done that. And, and also to address the pool, uh, that's really a, it's a fairly shallow pool, three, four feet. And it's very helpful for seniors to be able to do water aerobics, water therapy, et cetera. But that will have an inline pool cover on it for safety reasons and also for to help um, deter any evaporation from the pool so that the pool won't be continually evaporating water uh, and using up water. So I, I think and I can say we have done a tremendous job in dealing with water and dealing with this net zero. Uh, the other thing it is is it's an ongoing benefit. Once we remove that water usage from the community, even if we get into a, uh, once we get back to a normal water situation, Lake Casitas is full, that is an ongoing reduction of water use within the valley because those, these are going to be upgraded fixtures, turf removal, et cetera, that will continue to live on even if, you know, we get, you know, abundant water supply again. Um, the other comments that we had as far as uh, the, uh, I'd like to address those, the uh, emergency access from the easement, that is for emergency use only. I uh, have operated a senior facility in Simi Valley. We have a similar um, condition where we have a, an emergency access with an easement. We've operated that for 15 years to my knowledge that has never been used. Um, so I don't, I don't think that is going to be a uh, detriment to the neighbors. It's, it's something in case there's a major fire and we need fire service from that side or, or evacuation through that area. But we have plenty of room to move vehicles in and out of the, uh, of the project from El Roblar. Uh, and from the design aspects, we've, we've taken our cues from what we think are some of the iconic buildings within the Ojai Valley, and one of which is the Acacia Mansion, to, which to my knowledge is the original structure of Miner's Oaks, which is a large Andalusian mansion there. Um, so that's kind of what I have in a, in a nutshell, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you have. Are there any questions for the speaker? You're off the hook. We <laughs> might ask you uh, later if something else comes up. Okay, certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll call the speakers who are in opposition, first being Ed Sheb, followed by Wayne Latimer. I'm Edward Sheb, and I live in the unincorporated area of Miners Oaks, directly abutting the property in question on the west side. And I've heard a lot of things. Oh, if you will excuse me, I am deaf on one ear and I have great concern about understanding words on the other ear. Uh, I won't go into the water subject because it seems like it's been beaten up a little bit. The only thing I can commentate on water is that in the 30 years that I've lived next to the property in question is that we've had 
three, four times, even during the rainy days, when the Miners Oaks people had to go and get the water from Lake Cosetis because our wells ran dry. We were pumping air. And number two, there was something on the chart there about it fits in with the neighborhood and such, which I disagree with because I've only seen at the previous meeting with the planning committee or whatever it's called, the building itself was does not fit into the neighborhood on that street. According to the photos, it was painted in a garish white and had bell towers. Everything else on that block, in fact, all of Miner's Oaks, is earth tone. And in this specific area, this will stand out like a sore thumb. Okay, now I've heard rumors about a wall that is being built all around the property, concrete block wall, and it was supposed to be, or rumored to be, built on the property line. I don't think it would work out too well. It should be either on their side or whatever. That has never been mentioned anywhere. As I say, we're talking rumor. And uh, that should be something addressed by the gentleman who was right here and settled right now, or to my satisfaction, as to what happened. The rumor was that our fences will be torn down and on that property line, this concrete wall will be put up. What else? Oh, just on a personal question, I ask if there's a need for this thing. Uh, as it stands, we will have to import senior citizens just to be filling up the space. We have big, great gray gables and all that sort of stuff in the neighborhood, and I've never read anything in the OVN, Ojai Valley News, uh, about a very big shortage of ancient people trying to find a place to live. That's about the size of it. But I would like to have that wall question covered in this meeting, if possible, and find out exactly what was happening. Don't forget, this was just a rumor, and I don't know where it started. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you again, sir. Pardon? Thank you again. We'll follow up on your questions. Great. Thank you. Wayne Latimer, followed by Bill Jones. Good morning. My name is Wayne Latimer. I live at 166 Canterbury Court in Ojai. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly about the traffic study that was done and the safety in the Roblar, El Roblar vicinity. Okay, the traffic study was done on Rice Road and El Roblar and another one on La Luna and El Roblar. 
Both of these streets that intersect with the El Roblar are on the west end of the vicinity of Miner's Oaks. West of Rice Road is the river bottom. Between Rice Road and La Luna, which run parallel, between El Robilar and Lomita Street to the south are orchards, uh, horse facilities. There is no traffic there. I used to go jogging in that area because there was no traffic. So I don't know why they did traffic studies there. If you look at, at Miner's Oaks, the major traffic corridors are El Robilar and Lomita. And those two streets generate the bulk of the traffic on El Robilar. In the, in the, where the project is to be built now, between Hi Highway 33 and Lomita Avenue, there's been two traffic deaths in this last year. They were bicycle vehicle accidents. Okay. One of the problems that we have in Miner's Oaks is in many areas we have no sidewalks and no curbs. So in just between Highway 33 and Lomita, which is the next, next major road, and the project is in that vicinity, there are areas where there are no sidewalks and no curbs. As a result, when kids are walking to school, they have to walk out into the street. And the two properties just west of this project have that problem. One has a low block, uh, block wall, about two feet high, there's no curb, but they have some blocks out there that are probably 18 inches. So that serves as their sidewalk. If a car is parked next to that, anyone with a baby stroller or kids, they have to go out to the street to get around that vehicle. So I think the traffic study that was done by the county was inadequate. We have this problem throughout Miner's Oaks and along El Robilar because there is no parking other than on the street. So if we have a, a corridor that is going to be residential and commercial, okay, and we have no sidewalks and no curbs in many areas, we have a, a hazardous condition that we are imposing on the people of Miner's Oaks. Thank you. Thank you. No questions. Bill Jones followed by Brent Jacobs. I'm Bill Jones. I live at 128 Canterbury Court, adjacent to this project. I'd like to talk about the water use. Uh, I cannot find anybody that has this letter to serve, even the water district itself. <laughs> I've been down there, and all they can tell me is they are guaranteed back in 85 to provide 2.1 acre feet of water. <clears throat> now, I do have a current one here from Miner's Oaks, a conditional will to serve, giving them their 1.1 1 .1, or 2.13 and stating that they will require 4.27 from Casitas water. We are dry in Miner's Oaks. And after the rainy season, just like last year, we'll provide water probably for a couple months and it'll go dry again. This will be additional drain on this resource. Casitas water is at 35%. I've been told they're looking at going to stage four, which means a 50% reduction. We're currently at 30. Excuse me, sir, who gave you that information? Uh, 
of Mike Hollenbrand, general manager, Myers Oaks Water. Right. Are, are you familiar with the stage three declaration that exists? We're at 30% reduction now. Okay, so they have mandated a reduction of 30%. Already, yes. Already. Okay, go ahead, sir. And uh, this gentleman informs me that once they start supplying water to this development, they'll take that 30% cut from the 2.1. But the thing is, Myers Oaks should not provide them with six acre feet of water, six and a half almost, actually. That's why they're going to Casitas. I've been to Casitas. <laughs> they informed me they have a contract with Myers Oaks to deliver water. If they exceed that allotment, they're in breach of the contract, and uh, that's a legal thing, or they can fine them. And nobody knows who's going to pay the fine. Is that Myers Oaks? Or? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people, you know, living on fixed incomes, and their water rates keep going up as it is. When the water goes away, I don't know what all these people are going to do. And this worries me. But that, that six acre feet, if you look at the adjacent properties, they're all quarter acres, and they use half that water. Due to the high density here, they're going to be using twice as much water as anybody else in the area. And they talk about this uh, mitigated uh, negative declaration. They're looking at going outside the area to reduce water. Not on the source in Miners Oaks. They're talking Camarillo High, Valley High School. Down. If anything, this should be in the area of Miners Oaks, the source. And I don't see that anywhere. And I can't get a real definition of what this negative water is. I've been to the planning here, and they say that's an Ojai thing. Ojai Valley. So I have to try them. But this going outside the source to save water, I don't know what that does for my results. Could you hold just a second, sir? Mm -hmm. Question to staff. Uh, is this remediation plan go outside the Ventura River Basin? Or the upper basin? Okay. That, that was No, I understand. They're, they're looking into, sir, where they're going to draw this from. So we'll wait. Go ahead. Okay. Your presentation we'll hear in a minute. Okay. And if this place takes a 40% cut or a 50% cut, if we go into drought stage four, what happens to the residents there? Can they live on that? Or are they going to be evicted? I know it's going to be hard on us. What, who gave you information regarding an, an impending stage four or five drought? Uh, like I said, it was a Mike Hollenbrands, general manager, uh, Myers Oaks Water. And he indicated to you what, sir, that we, you may be going to that? We may be going, are to, going that. to that. Just may be going to that. Okay. So like I said, Lake Cassis is at 35% now. And I don't know when they can quit pumping due to the water level. I'm not sure of that. And that's our only other source. That's, that's the plan B. We don't have plan C. I know the county supervisor for our district, he's looking at, you know, desal, tapping into the Santa Inez Mountains for water. <laughs> that's not going to happen overnight. But I'm glad you, you have eyes and ears on this and you understand the problem. I, I kind of like to address the traffic situation too, the study. I don't think it was a full study. They took these intersections that are farther down the road than like the predecessor here was, was saying, Lomita, which is very close to this project. And there's two schools on that. If you come by that area at 7.30 in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon, you'll see how busy that gets. It's bumper to bumper. And on occasions when they've closed the highway due to trees or telephone poles, that's the main source people use, Lomita. I think a study should be done on that. Well, that's all I have to say, but I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir.
Any further questions? You guys have an answer yet? Yeah, I, I think in, in both of the MND and in the staff report, it says that the um, it says the words here, the project is conditioned to prepare and implement a water offset plan that would identify the total water demand for the project at full build out and then uh, use and then completely offset the total water demand for the project by retrofitting plumbing fixtures or installing other water saving measures within the Miners Oaks area. I think that we would be a little bit more broad about that and, and be more clear in the condition language and perhaps say, within the upper Ventura River Basin. Because I'm not sure, and I would have to, I'd have to be very clear, I'm not sure that that, that wording is very, is, is concise. The Miners Oaks area, you know, so we would have to, to really understand what that is. And then, you know, uh, the, the, if they were going to the high school, the high school is within the city, it's, it's adjacent to Miners Oaks, but is that in the Miners Oaks area? So for that, for that, for that point, I would want to be clear. I do want to be clear that we're not going to Camarillo, we're, we're, not going out of, uh, we're not going out of the Ventura River Basin, or we're not going out of the watershed area that is experiencing the problem. So I think that um, we'll take a look at that very quickly and make sure that that's clear while the hearing continues. So would you recommend then within the Ventura River Basin or the Upper Basin itself as defined, however defined? Yes, I, I mean, for me, I would, so to not limit it to, you know, maybe if we're trying to find all of these fixtures, we might not be able to find it in a Miner's Oaks area. I'm not sure if you guys have any opinions about that, but we might want to go broader just to make sure um, that we have enough fixtures that we can find in the basin that is being impacted, because that's really the crux to the issue. Okay, we still have speakers. Uh, Brent, uh, let, uh, let's, let's have the public hearing. Uh, Brent? Jacobs, thank you for your patience. I know you wanted to get in on this earlier. Sir, I apologize for my interruption. My name is Brent Jacobs. I'm a neighbor of the uh, proposed uh, project, and I'd like to actually speak uh, regarding a, a, a few things. Um, first, I've had many conversations with both Casitas Municipal Water District and the Miners Oak Water District. I do have quite a few relationships. Um, and, and clients uh, within the uh, within the community. Um, as referenced before, uh, Mr. Hollenbrand from the uh, Miners Oaks Water District stated that the, he absolutely regrets issuing the, the will serve letter um, back uh, quite a few years ago because it was a project that was actually for, it was a will serve letter that was based on a project that was one tenth of the of the size of this this proposed project. He said that um, that there's nothing that he can actually do about it. It's already gone. It's already actually in place, and that um, the additional waters, as previously discussed, will have to be supplied from 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 Casitas. So the will serve letter is actually from a, a, a very a much smaller uh, retail establishment within the within the, the proposed um, parcel. I had a conversation with um, Kara Isles who's a Lake Acetas um, Water District Supervisor. She is, um, she mentioned that Lake Acetas is currently at 35% and they stop uh, issuing any type of uh, requests or any type of permits when the lake gets to 30. So we're at 35 and we now have a 64 unit uh, assisted facility going into the area. I think that's ridiculous. I think that, uh, to this gentleman's point, I think the, the margin um, is just not there at this point in this, this actual draft. Excuse me, sir, just a moment. Uh -huh. Somewhere in the staff documents, I saw that reference to Lake Casitas was currently at 40, looking at 30 next year. I know that's in the documents I read. Is that, am I misreading? Did I, somewhere in those, that ton of paper, uh, I thought there was a statement that it was at 40 going to 30 next year. So 35. And it, at 30, what happens? They stopped doing anything. They stopped issuing absolutely everything. So no will serve letters? No permits to, to no additional meters. They stopped the base. They stopped the water usage going out. And that's not just from the, from Casitas Municipal Water. That's actually from six different contractors in the area. 
Go ahead, sir. So to me, the, this, uh, this issuing th this type of, of uh, four to four to six acre feet um, is, is, just, is just absolutely ridiculous at, at this point. We're, if, if the Lake Acetus was at 52 and they stopped issuing at 30, then sure, let, let, let it happen. Um, so we get around that by going ahead and getting to net zero, by retrofitting the fixtures, toilets, lawns, et cetera. Uh, within the within the surrounding areas, so I, I, I have a question to to, to everyone present. Um, has anyone seen the the signs out in front of uh, Miners Oaks School District that says or Miners Oaks School that says save our schools? Has anyone read the any articles within the paper that says, oh, which part of the Ojai Unified School District is going to actually be sold to support the funding? So we're gonna go ahead and now that we have absolutely, it sounds like to me there, there's, no, um, there's no way of, of actually monitoring the usage that's actually gone out and how this retrofitting has, is, 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 is running its course or doing its job over four or five years. What if we go ahead and retrofit the school and then it closes? That's gonna do, that's gonna do great for the, for the water, right? We're, we're still gonna have 64, 64 uh, units using water and we've retrofitted a school that can no longer be funded. That decision actually hasn't been made. So we don't know what schools we're gonna close yet. Um, so one of my major points is regarding the, regarding the, the, the water, um, let, the, let the actual, let the proof be there for a significant period of time. Let the proof be there that they have uh, gone to net zero, uh, that the retrofitting has, has worked um, and then issue the permits or issue the uh, the, the the right to the right to build on that. I think that the the actual margin is is way too close. And then obviously within the within the the um, yeah, I, I'm always a, a, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of increasing revenue and increasing commerce, et cetera, within within communities and, and building up GDP, et cetera. But um, We've already have a community that's pretty much done everything they can to reduce their water usage, guys. There's, uh, there's, um, there really isn't any green grass out there. Um, there's uh, kids at schools picking on each other because their dad's sprinklers are on. There's, um, there's uh, every, everything that I think has, has actually been, been done, at least for, for the time being, has 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 been done. So to, to issue this this type of, uh, of 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 permit for this type of project, I, I think is I think is ludicrous with this amount of margin available at the, within the within the um, uh, within the, the lake. So um, it it was a, a like I said a, a will serve letter that was that was put in place for quite a few years ago. And that they're needing to get the additional waters from Casitas, and they're very close to um, not letting single-family homes go into Ojai because there's just there's just not the water there. Um, so actually reducing the, the the flow for students, less uh, green lawns, less playing fields, um, less sprinklers for kids to, to play in, et cetera. I don't think is is worth the actual revenue that's that. Uh, for this for this this actual project it's already been done we've already done everything that we, we can um and then regarding the, the actual traffic study i've been told that if this is going to generate about 82 trips a, a day into into the valley so why isn't there a traffic study done where the real traffic is which is through casita springs actually getting through casita springs and outside of casita springs because we're going to bring employees in from all different communities obviously and we're also going to bring in families for this nursing facility to visit their elderly parents or elderly family members within the Ojai valley the real problem is casita springs so where's the traffic study been done regarding casita springs i know that the parcel across the street was uh building on that parcel was denied because of the traffic through the casita springs area and i think that should be uh looked at and um, so 
don't see it being the right the right type of uh, development within the community of Ojai. We have a, a community that's that's struggling because we don't have the families that can afford to live there to support the schools, so the schools are actually closing. And I don't see another elderly assisted facility within within Ojai uh, benefiting the, the community. There's already enough, and I think that uh, it would it would uh, definitely hinder the diverse uh, structure that Ojai needs to survive. That's all I have. I have a question. Go ahead. You said you spoke to the manager of the Miners Oaks Water Company, right. Water District. Right. And was it your testimony that he, he he regrets issuing the original will serve letter for the, the lesser project? Absolutely. That yeah. was a convers personal conversation that he and I had in his office. Okay. Uh, uh, did he say he would not issue a new will serve? Absolutely. Letter? The will serve letter that we see he, it, dated April or August 30th, is it? Of? The one that's conditional. The last line in black bold says this is not a will serve letter. Okay. Did he, did you talk to him about that at all? Did you, have you he, seen he, that? He, he simply said, and he, and he spoke from a, from a layman's customer standpoint, obviously, to me, that the will serve letter was issued many many years ago well there's two basically i understand there's an initial well-served letter that's they say they'll serve everybody within the district there, at least i read that in the record somewhere yeah. and then there's this will serve letter that we're talking about I, that's been cited in the documents that says it's not a will serve letter it says conditional will serve letter then the last line in bold print says this is not a will serve letter i was told that it is a will serve letter for a much much smaller project 20 plus years ago but i i don't know this that's all i know okay yeah i don't know the the nature of the stages so that's fine okay. thank you sir okay. thank you okay so now we're at the point where we will have a rebuttal by the applicant thank you um, a couple of things that I guess I should mention for um, the project itself. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that we have the fastest growing segment of the population in uh, our county or people over 80 years of age, and that's accelerating dramatically uh, with the aging of the baby boomers. Um, Ojai, in fact, has almost double the concentration of people in that age group as the county as a whole or the state as a whole. Um, when we looked at, uh, initially looked at this project, we did a survey of the assisted living facilities within the Ojai area, and at that time, all of them were on a waiting list for people to move in. Um, just there are, is not enough facilities for the demand within the community. Um, and so that's why we felt this was appropriate. Uh, to address traffic, our residents are they're living in a facility like this because they typically don't drive they're they're at a stage in their life where they're not driving we don't generate uh, from the resident standpoint almost any traffic at all uh, from staffing uh, at the project as uh, the uh, conditions are is that we would not impact specifically um, highway 33 during peak hours um, and that fits in with our normal operations of the property because if we have people coming from outside of Ojai, they're driving, say, from Ventura north on the 33 during the morning hours, which is not the peak. Uh, that's not impacted on peak traffic because most of the traffic is going south into Ventura. Um, and it fits in also with our changes because we typically, our busiest time is early in the morning when people are getting up, getting dressed, getting breakfast. That's our, our major staffing times. And so when our staff changes happen, we're not also impacting that traffic on uh, the 33 through um, uh, at that squeeze point. Uh, we, um, we also did, within the traffic study, they looked at all those areas. We looked at additional intersections that the traffic um, asked us to look at, and we were able to conclude that there was no impact 
or minimal impact on the traffic. We also, from our own side, we did a survey of a, a familiar, uh, similarly sized projects just to look at visitors. And we did a month long daily count of visitors to the project, um, weekdays, weekends, et cetera, even holidays. And the reality is that there aren't a lot of visitors. Um, there are some visitors. What we found uh, interesting, though, is that the majority of the visitors' trips were the same three or four people who live close to the community and would come over and visit their mother or father uh, on those times. Where you see visitors is on holidays, Mother's Day. Um, our typical residence an 85-year-old woman. Um, but that's not a high traffic time for, um, you know, it's not a commuter time, it's not a work day specifically. And so most of our parking is going to be used by visitors that come in. I mean, we're not going to have, I operated two assisted living facilities of similar size. We literally only had two or three people that were residents that had cars. Um, because there, a lot of times it's a family decision and if one of the decisions of family is, hey, it's not appropriate for mom or dad to be driving around. You know, we need to have some, they need some assistance. They need some help. And, and certainly if, if a resident is capable of doing that, we have parking available and they, they can do that. But they're not commuters. They're not going back and forth to work or, or going to school or those types of things. Um, and I, I want to still hit on this net zero water. Because um, I think we're, we're focusing and, and the community is focusing on this six acre feet or this projected six acre feet of water that we would be pulling out of uh, the, the watershed, but we are conditioned to make that a zero. So whatever water that we would use on, on our project would be offset off site somewhere. And that would be, and we're certainly happy to do that just in that upper Ventura watershed basin that we, we would impact. Um, and I, I want to reiterate to that, that six acre feet is based on old, older facilities that are operating and they're, they're measuring their water meters historically. Not, that's not taken from a new facility with low impact watering, you know, landscaping with low flow showers and toilets, et cetera, et cetera. So we will be doing an extensive study. We've already contracted for that to show our actual water use and we will be offsetting that and we have to prove that to the benefit of the county that we are offsetting that water use within the community. So from a water standpoint, we are not going to be exacerbating uh, the water usage within in the upper Ventura River Watershed District at all. Um, so I, I think it's unreasonable to, to, to continue to beat this that we're using this six acre feet when we are required not to use that. Um, so uh, we think obviously, you know, we're, we're the proponents. This is uh, uh, the state at large. We have one of the oldest populations in this state. Ventura County has a very uh, significant aging population. And most of our residents are going to be coming from that area that don't have alternatives. It's that, that population is aging, and they'd love to stay in the area. They don't want to have to move away. Will, will we have people from outside of Miners Oaks? I'm sure we will. We'll have some people from Ventura that would love to live in Ojai. Uh, but it's really a, a, a facility or a, we are serving a huge need within the community and within the county at large. I mean, this is something that I think most everyone recognizes that even Stanford says, hey, there's this tsunami coming of the aging population. And so we think this is a very appropriate use uh, of this project. It's an infill site uh, close to the hospital, close to doctors, close to the services that our residents would use. And we think it's very appropriate. So if you have any other questions. I, I do. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, address uh, one speaker's concern about the wall construction, that everyone's fences would be demolished and you would put up a... We're happy if, if our neighbor doesn't want that on the property line, we're happy to shift that over, you know, the three inches so it's only on our property. 
if if that if the neighbor would like us to do that. Currently, there's a uh, a wood slat fence there, and in, within our plan, we would remove that fence and put up a a block wall along that uh, property line. If if our neighbor doesn't want us to do that, we will shift the fence into our you know the three inches over onto our property and just have it on our property line. Yeah, coast solely on our property. And regarding the garish white, um, that's, that sounds funny, but my experience at, at a beautiful, um, otherwise beautiful uh, um, commercial development in Westlake, mm -hmm. um, there was a, a white wall and it glared like you cannot believe, and the night lighting also, um, just it lit up the interior of people's homes so that the the um, developer, I think his name was Selleck, mm -hmm. um, changed changed the um, the paint color uh, to not have it uh, glare. Is that something well, that you would be? Yeah, um, we, we would be open to, to that. Sure, we're looking at it. It's not going to be. I don't think a, it's going to be similar to if you're familiar with the hospital. That similar, but we're not. You know, if, if the community said, hey, we'd like to see it more of an off-white or, or some other color, we're not necessarily... I wouldn't, I wouldn't have believed it unless I had seen it with my own eyes. This is a target development in Westlake Village where um, uh, the white, um, after, after it was developed, uh, it was, everybody went, well, how about that? <laughs> well, I, I should also mention that these are all one-story buildings. The buildings all sit down um, because of the just the topography. So our buildings all sit down. A, what is that? About three feet below the street. Two feet below the street level. So it's not like a big beacon of a you know a, a multi-story building sitting there. But but we would be certainly open to that. I mean, but we're there is a, but there is an element that sure there is that um, uh, in one person's opinion anyway it would stick out and mm -hmm. so um, if there was a way to soften that if you could work we're, with we're certainly staff and and uh, neighbors regarding that um, same thing with the wall construction um, so uh, another question that somebody had was um, this question of whether or not uh, the traffic study analyzed the the traffic on Lomita and uh, I, I don't remember the intersections right off the top of my head, but we analyzed all the intersections that the county asked us to look at, and we looked at additional intersections also because they, the traffic study was very thorough because um, that is an issue within uh, Ojai is that there is a basically you cannot add trips to Highway 33 during peak hours. And so we had to look at that and look at all the intersections. Matt, you probably know what intersections were addressed. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Chair Adukas. Um, the intersections that were addressed, um, Lomita and El Robar was not. However, the intersections further to the west, as the uh, commenter stated, Rice and La Luna were, those were evaluated, um, I believe, uh, because they are direct connections between the highway to the south and El Robla, whereas Lomita peels off of La Luna uh, to the east and then curves up to El Robla. And the Transportation Division reviewed the uh, submitted traffic study and found it acceptable, and they included that in their uh, analysis for the initial study and mitigated negative de declaration. Along with, um, and there was some mention of the critical Casita Springs area earlier, they include an analysis of that, and they would not be adding any peak hour trips uh, in the specific directions, like uh, as stated. Thank you. But, but this is the closest to the Maricopa Highway and El Roblar. So. The, uh, the intersection with El Roblar and Highway 33 was evaluated as well, and found not to exceed the threshold criteria. Are there other questions of the speaker? I have, I have one. Um, is there, obviously you're going to have a kitchen on prem, mm -hmm. provide meals. What, what are you doing about laundry services? Uh, that's on, that's on, on the premises. Each building has its own small laundry um, facility there. So we have, it's, 
it's basically, I guess the best way to describe is it's like four large homes on the site. Yeah, so yeah. so it's, it is a more intimate kind of familial setting for our residents rather than, I think most people are familiar with larger assisted living, uh, pro the, like a big hotel or something that someone, that people live in. This is basically more like a four large 16 bedroom homes that people would live in. But we, we will have some laundry facilities in, in each building. The, those will be hooked up to our gray water system, though, so that we will reuse any of that water from the laundry facilities for our any irrigation that we do on the site. So we're re, we're basically reclaiming and reusing a, a significant portion of the water from uh, the usage on that. And it's uh, as I said, it's basically a. a pretty state-of-the-art system where we filter all, all the water that comes through. It's, we have two separate sets of, of um, sewer pipes. We have uh, these specific pipes that are only for basically showers, laundry, um, basins, those types of things go through that, go through a filtration system, and go into a holding tank that is used to, to irrigate the property. So we're not um, using the irrigation meter that we already have. We wouldn't be using that. So your laundry uh, services are done by staff? Work by staff, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Kessling. Good job. <laughs> um, can you kind of describe what your um, maintenance practices are for the facilities with ongoing issues that come up with fixtures and so on? We'll, ha we'll have an, uh, a full-time maintenance person that uh, works at the site that deals with any of those, any maintenance issues that we have. Um, it's uh, from my experience and, and basically from data the, in the market as a whole, these are pretty, there's low wear and tear really on, on facilities like this just by the nature of the residents. So it's not like a family uh, apartment complex or something like that, but we would be maintaining those those fixtures with a full-time staff member. Uh, you know, uh, also our landscaping, any of the landscaping irrigation, things like that. We, will ha we have a full-time maintenance person. Okay, thank, thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, so now is closing comments by staff? Uh, thank you, Chair Dukas. I, I have a few things that I'd like to address specifically in condition 27, which will be mitigation measure 20, uh, I'm sorry, 26, for the water offset plan. I think in what we're hearing today, I, I, I would recommend that we um, update a couple of things. One, the requirement um, to submit it and have it approved by the planning director, not planning staff, so I would be able to, to see what it is that they're submitting. This, the second is in the, in the first paragraph where we're talking about the requirement that the water offset plan shall include the number and type of plumbing fixtures um, that you know within the upper Ventura River groundwater basin. And I just took a look at that basin and I think that would be better language, very specific language about what we're trying to offset. Um, I, we could also get at Commissioner um, Kessley's concerns by, by asking um, through this mitigation measure as well that we have an annual report verification for a number of years. I mean, I think it behooves the, the applicant to maintain all of the low flow fixtures that they have, clearly because it's going to be saving them the water bill, but we can verify that for a number of years to ensure that that's working after our first verification before they could get certificate of uh, occupancy. Um, we could also develop a condition for the color palette that we could take a look at the full color palette, the paint, the roof, and everything together to make sure that we're satisfied with that, and that could be approved um, at the planning director level before uh, before they begin any sort of um, construction. So, so I, th I believe that we could get at that. Um, also, I just would want to be clear. I, I did take a look at the Miners Oaks, their current uh, website. It is the um, uh, the stage three water shortage, the same water shortage that, that is very uh, specifically outlined on page seven of 29 of your staff report. That's the very same thing that's on their website. So we have the latest information as far as public information goes, right, uh, contained in our website. I'd also want to say that, you know, clearly, you know, I'm watching the news as everybody else does about the school closure out there. As far as I understand, that elementary school is still going to remain. But I think that, you know, we would be very careful 
to to use um, this mitigation measure in schools that were going to remain, right? So we probably wouldn't pick a school that's under jeopardy. We would probably go towards the high school. So this has to, this is a, a plan that has to be submitted and reviewed by us. So we would sit down with our watershed protection district. We would sit down with the schools. We would have a more in-depth conversation. It's nothing that's going to be done casually at all. And we're going to be able to, to verify the results. So I think that, you know, adding those uh, those more direct uh, requirements under mitigation measure 26 will be more helpful for me and for the applicant. Could you also include, in addition to that color palette, um, some exploration about the, the wall and the neighbor and, and its location? Yes. Thank you. So do I understand your recommendation is there will be an annual compliance review? Well, I, I'm, I'm just simply saying maybe we could do an annual compliance review for three years or five years, you know, so we can ensure that um, the fixtures that are there that we agree to would, would still be would still be there and installed. I understood that that was Commissioner Kessler's concern. And you define the area for, for which the remediation would take place as what the Ventura River Basin and Upper Basin. The Ventura River yeah. Upper Basin. Yes, okay. we just took a look at the map of that. And this has to be done before anything else is issued in pro process of uh, developing this project. Right, so the, the, the timing of the condition page, it's on page 19 of 37. The permittee shall submit the water offset plan to the planning division, and now that would say planning director, for review and approval prior to the issuance of zoning clearance for construction. So they wouldn't be able to begin construction until the details of the water offset plan were agreed upon. Oh, yeah, and that points out that prior to then, then prior to use, inauguri use inauguration, it has to be proved up, right? That so they have to submit it and get it approved before they can build it, and then they have to prove it up that it worked before um, before use inauguration. So it all has to be buttoned up. Um, there was one last thing that um, uh, a speaker uh, said that shouldn't the um, Miners Oaks residents. Um, needs for water reduction be like the first tier? Is there any way, I understand for, for to do it most effectively, it makes sense to go to the schools, but um, uh, one person at least suggested that Miners Oaks residents should be served first. Is there any way to, um, to do that? I believe that we could list that as a priority level Right, but I think they're all served from the same basin. So if you save water in the basin, they're all being served. Um, but I think that we could put some priority level into it, saying if there was something that we could do in the Miners Oaks proper area, that we could start there, and then and then go out to the basin after that. Okay. Are there any other questions of staff at this time? Well, I'm just a little disappointed we don't have a water district representative here to to address this. Um, but you will be working with the water district, and if and they could hold up the project by not issuing a will serve letter. They already got regardless. it. Regardless, yeah. All they have to do is pay the money. Yeah. Now I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Well, I'll have some discussion. And some discussion. Do you want to start? Sure. Commissioner Onstop. First of all, I understand and appreciate the need for the facility. I don't minimize that at all. But there seems to be enough evidence to indicate this water question is not resolved, at least in my mind. We've got this Miners Oaks, no new connections. We've been 
we've told the casitas from which they get the balance of their water is at 40, looking at 30. And one of the witnesses here testified that as soon as they go to 30, there'll be no new connections. I, I guess I'm somewhat skeptical because of the difficulties involved in the remediation plan that gets you to z zero. And the whole water issue beyond that and the continuing drought creates enough doubt in my mind that I can't vote for a negative declaration. I would vote for a focused EIR on water so all of this would be literally flushed out so that we would have representatives of all the important agencies testifying or having input on this issue. I think we're very close to moratoriums if we're not already there. But based on the evidence in front of us today, I have sufficient doubts that I'm unwilling to support a negative declaration without a focused EIR or without having a focused EIR on water. And I, as I said, I understand and appreciate the need for the facility and its purpose. It's, it's certainly needed. But this whole water issue, uh, I, I just can't get my arms all the way around the big picture. I understand and appreciate if they go to zero, there won't be. But we can't control Mother Nature. The levels of water continue to drop, drop, drop. And I'm hesitant with the information that is in front of us now to authorize a CUP. Commissioner Rodriguez. Commissioner Onstadt uh, uh, has spoken to the issue extensively. Um, my comments would be very similar. Uh, I also see the benefit uh, to the senior population of having an extended care facility. Um, um, that would serve uh, that area um, if, in fact, it's true there are people are on waiting lists to, to get into the existing facilities that may be around, and I don't doubt that. But I have a problem um, um, with the mit mitigation issues and uh, uh, at what point they will occur um, and how, they, how the compliance can be enforced. Um, I think it's a stretch. Um, saying that the mitigation issues will be, uh, will be uh, to the level or to the point that it, uh, we're at net zero, um, so there's no additional draw on the existing water supply. Um, and just extending, just hypothetically beyond that, if in fact uh, the CUP is granted, you know, at what point do those, do those mitigation issues come into effect? Do they come into effect before uh, municipal water, uh, minors of municipal water issues an actual unconditional will serve letter, or is it done after they receive a letter? And then that puts it back on the developer or the, uh, the applicant here in front of us, and, and it becomes an enforcement issue on this, on this uh, planning department. Um, I'm not inclined to support this this uh, request for CEP and neg uh, negative declaration. Well, I, I tend to agree with um, Commissioner Onstott that I would be more comfortable with um, a little bit more information and um, assurance on, on the water use. Um, so, um, again, I personally have had to look for um, senior housing for my father recently, and I do know that there are waiting lists in Ojai, but um, that's beside the point. Um, you know, 64 units, uh, 64 beds is, is, a, uh, is a reasonable size facility uh, to be issuing uh, water permits um, at, at this point. So I'm not ready to make a motion, um, but I would agree with um, Commissioner Onstott that it, the, the project has merit, but I think it still needs um, a couple of things addressed. Do you wish to speak? 
Yeah, I will do, I will add some comments to that. Um, I agree with Commissioner Onstad and all the other comments. There is grave concern about what's going on in our state with water. However, I have a difficult time with the whole idea of restricting development based on something that has not occurred yet and what might not or might happen in the future. You have a property that has zoning clearance for a specific use. Where I had some concerns was the change of that use to something that's going to utilize more water than what was already originally um, appropriated to that particular property and that use. Um, I do feel that the applicant is going to do what is necessary to mitigate that and get it to the zero um, net. And I am confident that staff is going to do what's necessary to ensure that that happens. So on that basis, I have a hard time denying the, pro the, the project. And, and I agree with that. Um, I think the main thing is the net zero. And I think the, the, the fact that this developer can come in and do something that really um, betters not just his little project, but something that's going to be a benefit to the larger area is something that compels me. Um, the fact that um, it's going to be um, designed uh, to, uh, to do things that other projects don't, which is um, to utilize gray water. Um, it's, it looks like it's very minimal landscaping uh, uh, that's going to be served by that gray water and that there's going to be um, you know, a means, a quantifiable means and a plan that's going to be uh, looked at and approved before this use inauguration, um, I think answers the concern. Should we be concerned about water? Absolutely, without, without a doubt. Um, but I think the way that this project has been designed uh, says no net water. And, um, and I've got to move forward with the, uh, with the idea that we can um, be resilient in the face of climate change, and we can uh, have plans and um, uh, means to deal with, um, you know, less water, using less water. And I think this project um, shows that um, this is how you do it. So I'm inclined to support it. I, I like those comments and that... Um and I agree that it, it would be nice to have the project and that I don't know if there's anything else that the project planner could do to, um, that they aren't already, um, haven't already explored. Um, but then if we do go to a stage four and, and water um, has to be cut significantly uh, more, is that something that the, um, I guess that's something that the facility would have to figure out um, on how they could meet the needs of their, of their residents and cu cut their water usage even further. Um, Do you have your, well, a laudable project. I, I, I don't fault the project at all, and I understand why staff has done the, what they have done. But there's so much uncertainty dealing with the water issue, and so many people weren't here today from the various agencies and instrumentalities that deal with this that I would be, if I got to focus the IR back that substantiate the position of staff, I'd vote for the project. But I don't have enough information to support the project. And the only way I know to get it is to have a focused EIR. Can we ask for a focused EIR? Well, we have something in front of us first. Mm -hmm. Chair Ducas, could I intervene for a moment? Yes. Um, one, two things you should take under consideration. One, if, if, if the Planning Commission is considering denial, we would, we would really need to go back and, and, and write some specific findings for denial. I don't believe that we could do that today um, because it is a housing project and we would have to take that very seriously. Um, two, 
something that you should also take into consideration is that Ojai uh, Valley area policy says um, all new discretionary development should be required to retrofit existing plumbing fixtures or do a net zero offset. So essentially what we would be saying here is we don't believe that could be done for any project and so therefore there would be no more discretionary development in this area, right? We know what we know right now. We know stage three. We know we have a uh, conditional uh, will serve letter from Miners Oaks and we know Casitas backs it up. We know the will serve letter says we'll serve you if you pay the money, right? So we know all of those things to be true and that's all we're going to be known true for any development that we have out there. So I would just, I would offer a couple of things. One, if it, if, if it looks like it would be denial that you would just postpone it and, and let us work with those findings because we don't have that available for you today. Uh, two, if there's some other information, I'm not sure what other information we would find um, in a focused water EIR that we didn't already disclose in the, in the, the, the thorough analysis that was done um, in the mitigated neg negative declaration. So it's not a negative declaration, it's a mitigated negative declaration saying the water issue can be mitigated by working with the water companies and working with the groundwater section and working with the planning department to do this retrofit. So it is a significant document based on water. That said, um, I only heard this morning that maybe the water issue was going to be more controversial maybe than I already thought. So we would have had somebody here from the water district. We can postpone the hearing and have somebody here from the water district if, if that would alleviate any concerns as well. So there's a few different options, but I did just want to caution you on the findings issue because I'm not sure that we could accommodate that today. What you're saying is one of the options available to us is to continue the hearing sure. to a time certain request representative Sure, that's that's always your option. Well, I'm, I'm prepared. I can support that idea. I just I want more information. I don't know. If, well, I want more. Information. And I guess just to follow up on what the planning director said, if if the decision ultimately would be to uh, require a, a, an EIR, then there should be a discussion and, and facts in the record, substantial evidence stating why your commission does not believe the water offset mitigation measure would be sufficient to mitigate that impact because that's that's basically why you would be sending it to an EIR. So we, we would need that substantial evidence. We don't have that. One of the problems is, is uh, everything outside of the scope of what we're doing here uh, is the larger climactic situation and what we're looking at down the road in terms of the drought. Grant the CUP, they get to zero, the drop continued, and then they're asked to be cutting back another 25 or 30 percent. What's the effect on the residents that are living there or the operation itself? I mean, it's not just what is what is in front of us in terms of the CUP and the remediation plan. There's a bigger picture here, too, that has to be considered, and you can't ignore it. And I don't know how we deal with that. But I'm not satisfied with the information I have to approve the project. I would entertain a motion or I would make a motion to continue the matter to a time certain to allow staff to assemble the players that control the water in the area and know the most about it to come talk to us and develop whatever she needs to develop in case we should deny the project or amend the project. Is it, based uh, on the information we get. I, I would second that, uh, that motion uh, because I'm leaning toward uh, denying the project as I sit here, unless there's more information. That would get you somewhere short of a focused EIR. So you want to continue to as time certain so that you can hear, hear testimony from uh, what we already have in our, in our well, um, packet? We, we don't, yes, we don't have the people who manage Casitas or the people that manage Miners Oaks. We don't, I don't know that we have one of the individuals you said was out or ill that represents the county. I don't know what that person could add or not add, but I'd certainly want to get as much information as I could before I had to make a decision. I mean, I understand the project and its goals and they're laudable. I move the matter be continued to a time certain 
and give the staff the direction to get the principal players to come to that hearing so, so that we could take testimony on the issues, on the water issues or traffic or whatever else anybody wants to talk about. But I think we're probably, are we talking about traffic too? Or are we talking water or both? Well, mine's water. So we ha we do have a motion. Okay. Can and we have a second from Richard Rodriguez. We've already had this stated. So can we have the screen up so we can vote on that? That's for a continuation. So it's 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 a yes for a continuation and a no for a no continuation. So uh, that's what we have. We have it uh, continued to a date certain in order to receive more information regarding the net zero water plan. So right. then the, the date certain would, would now be fun to do. So uh, December 15th, I have you all available. I don't know if I have the water people available, but I'll see what I can do um, if it's you know so we can set it for December 15th excuse, at eight, excuse at me excuse me uh, uh, Kim um, I've got a commitment on the 15th that's come up since the last time I provided information so I will not be uh, available on the 15th of December Well, then we would have to do it in the new year, and I don't have anybody's availability in the new year because both uh, December 22nd and December 29th, we don't have a quorum. And you may not have me. <laughs> Commissioner Onstott just pointed out that we may not have him either. <laughs> given, the, given the change in um, supervisor. Uh, will the planning commissioners continue to serve in, at the at the new uh, board members' pleasure until they say otherwise? So, I haven't heard anything, um, but you know it could be possible. So, that that's our option. With continuing it, that's that's the predicament that we have. So we don't have a date certain. Well, unless unless everybody wants to commit to a, a date now, right? So we have. January 5th, January 12th, we have those dates. Well, you, you need some time to obviously contact people who have schedules. It yep. is December. But if you're doing it to a time and date certain, I mean, and if we go out to January, I'm fairly confident I can, I can get somebody from each of the water districts to come. Do you, do you need time? No. You don't need five minutes? Okay. No, so, but I would need... Um, I have I don't have commitments from anybody except Commissioner Rodriguez in the January schedule. Good. Pardon me? Oh, there's four pages, so oh, I see. Uh, January twelfth. Did you do yours? January twelfth. Adukas Cali. You don't, you don't have so Commissioner Onstotts. January, January 12th, oh, I don't have uh, yeah, on How do I know if I'm going to get Commissioner? <laughs> she said unless you're, unless she... I'm available. On January the 12th? Whenever. So, uh, uh, Jeff, are you available on the 12th? Yeah. Okay. So January 12th? Can I assume that you are going to amend the staff recommendation to... Define the area of the remediation to that Ventura River Basin. Right, or we'll something. bring back the new mitigation measure on January 12th, and, okay. and from what we discussed today, we'll bring back a revised. Okay. So January 12th at um, 8:30 a.m. Does that work for you guys? Yeah. yeah. Does it work for the public? <laughs> it it will be open to the public. Yes. Yes. You're notified right now. No. 
Okay. That's all for that. Uh, we're going to move on with our uh, meeting. If, uh, if you're done here, thank you very much for coming down, and we'll see you back January 12th. Right now, it's report by the planning director on board actions and other matters. Do you want to take, do you want to take two minutes? Sure. Okay. So now we will have discussion 8A. Uh, very good. Thanks, uh, Chair Dukas and members of the commission. I want to just report um, quickly on some board actions that had to do with uh, one of your cases. So on um, November 15th, the board heard an appeal um, that your commission had a previously heard appeal. This one was on Murata Petroleum. It was the reactivation operation and maintenance of three currently idle oil and gas wells. Appeal number 89. <laughs> uh, the board upheld uh, your decision on a four to one vote. Um, and then also the next thing that is on the uh, board's agenda was an item that the Planning Commission heard on the 20th. That is our Phase 2B update of our local coastal plan, which includes wireless communication, the coastal trail, enforcement and penalties, as well as some general organizational updates. Um, so that's going to the board next Tuesday. So uh, your agenda was nice and clear until <laughs> our last item. <laughs> and so uh, we'll be seeing you on, on January the 12th. Um, an issue on that too, that you know we can continue items, or if any of you sees something in the in the board letter or in the in the planning commission staff report that you think that you would want somebody specific at the hearing, you can also feel free to call, and we'll make sure to to get those people at the hearing because we're not Good always point. sure what's going to be controversial or what's going to be of interest to the commission. So if you say ever you know you're reading through it, I think I'd like the harbor commissioner to come or I think I would like you know somebody from the water district to come we can arrange those people to come in advance of the hearing so that that's just as something else that's an aside um, I also sent you all an email um, which I am going to be uh, instructing uh, the the incoming class of board members through CSAC the association of the county association or the association of counties California Association of counties um, and that is going to be about 70 or 80 incoming board members from different counties. And I'm going to do that this year with um, the planning director for Butte. And so I sent a note out to all of you guys because it's always interesting to see what you have. I know uh, Commissioner Duke has wrote me a nice thing about, you know, things that are helpful and, and also things that are not or things that you wish you would have had coming in. It's a big job, right? Planning commissioner job or the board job, it's, it's both big. And so we're trying to give some words of advice and wisdom about things that you should ask for, or hopefully, you know, if your planning director isn't providing you some sort of a service, that you should be asking for that up front. So anything from your experience for, for me to take up to Sacramento in, in February will be helpful. I, I did send you guys an email on that. Um, we usually also have a, a uh, some sort of lunch that we get together, either before the holidays or after. So now that we're meeting on the 12th, maybe that will be a time that we can schedule our, our lunch right after that. That's a good opportunity. So we can have this item in the morning and then after the item is, is finished, unless there's something else, we could put something else on the item between now and then, but um, uh, Anna is going to help us arrange a, a lunch for you all. And so we'll, we'll do that on the 12th and we'll be sending out some more information on that as well. Um, we do have big retirements happening in the, in the planning division. That, that does make me a little nervous. So, um, you know, Brian Baca is going to be leaving at the end of February or going to be retiring. And Rosemary Rowan, well, the, sure our long-range planning. To the, to the luncheon. Hmm. Oh, all the managers come to the luncheon. Okay. okay. That's who buys you lunch. <laughs> 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 uh, and so, um, 
Uh, both of them will be retiring. We're in the middle of doing interviews right now, so hopefully we'll have some some good candidates because those are big big shoes to fill in in managing those big projects in the planning department. Um, I think that's all I have for you. I, um, Anna keeps a, a lovely list of things that you ask us to follow up on, and right now that list is empty, so we'll see if, if, if I get something today. Any comments post-election about some of the measures that passed that will be coming through? I know what she's talking about. Yeah, so, Prop 64. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, how's Chris doing with yeah. 64? That item is going to the board on the 6th, right? I guess I don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. The marijuana the initiative? The marijuana oh. Except the kids don't do it like that anymore. So this doesn't even have any significance. They <laughs> <laughs> do, do it like this now. I have to. Seriously? They do. The they, they, yeah, the vape or the yeah. bong. Or. So that, that item is going, uh, going to the board <laughs> on the 6th. So we'll get some direction from the board about what it is that they would like to do. Uh, it's medical marijuana. Then there's also recreational or adult use marijuana. Um, and then the item of um, short-term rentals. Is being has been continued to the board, which uh, will be the 13th. It will be Supervisor's Long, Supervisor Long's last uh, meeting, which will be sad those, for us. Is it restricted to geographical areas, or is it countywide? Um, it's up to the board. So, on in that particular staff report, some of the board members expressed interest in doing things a little different in different places. So that was outlined for them as an option they could choose. Um, and so they're still taking public testimony. I believe they had over 120 speakers, and so they only got through half of them. So the item is going back on the 13th, um, and so they can provide staff direction on that as well. So those are two big items that are happening. Uh, it's just a simple question. If you got R1 zoning, how can you have a rental unit, short-term, long-term, or otherwise? People rent out their homes. And no, rent I know out their that, rooms but I mean, time. it's violation of zoning ordinance. That's not the way we see it. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, but so, but right now, I would say as 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 the zoning ordinance exists right now, it doesn't really talk about it, right? So that's what we're really look, looking for the board's direction. How would you like to see it, and how should we then incorporate the 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 directions of the board into the zoning ordinance to make it more clear? It doesn't talk about short-term vacation rentals. Nobody has, you know, until the last few years when this is is started to rise up. I noted uh, the city of Santa Barbara, who has banned them, has uh, being sued today. I read that case and so you know outright banning them is is problematic you know and, and and cities are getting sued from that the coastal commission has a real uh, bent on that and and communities that are trying to work them in through overlay districts uh, I see one from the city of Carpinteria on the coastal commission's agenda the coastal commission is going to be in Ventura for their December meeting at City Hall and so that one the Coastal Commission is recommending approval of. So they have banned them in some places. They put overlay districts in some places. They put, um, uh, which will make some of the ones that are existing in the city of Carpinteria, however, uh, non-conforming. So they've put a fi five-year time limit to phase them out outside of their overlay districts. So every jurisdiction is doing it differently. And we've given the board lots of different options and lots of different uh, ways to choose how other people are doing it, how they would like to do it. and so. I think between the staff report and the public testimony that they're giving, they'll give the planning department some direction about the ordinance they would like us to write. So that's where we are with short-term vacation rentals. It's quite that. So, so when is it appropriate for planning commissioners to to weigh in on that? Once we get direction from the, so so we can't try to steer that boat. A little. Well, the board's steering that boat right now, right? And so they'll tell us uh, the, 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 the big general direction about which way to go. And then, of course, when we bring back the, the ordinance language, that ordinance language comes through, you know, comes through the, uh, the planning commission. So, you know, we'll see the scope and scale of that direction. And, and if we need to come to the planning commission at some, some point in the process to say, you know, should we go here, should we go there, within the umbrella of what the board wants, we can come back. It, you know, it could be a simple assignment from the board. We we don't know, and so depending on how complex, you know, we'll either come back come back when we're when we're finished with the draft, or we'll come back midway through and and get some direction from the planning commission. And are they? T uh, is the board also looking at requests 
for, from farmers or people with these big, large buildings that would be appropriate for indoor grows? Are they, are they looking at that? Is there a planning, wow. planning efforts on yeah. that? I'm going to send yeah, you right after this. I'm going to send you because it was on my to-do list yesterday. We have, we have determined what Mr. Onstad is going to do during his retirement. <laughs> I'm going to send you two things. I'm going to send you the link to what went out um, to the public uh, just a couple of days ago on, on the framework of what the board's going to be looking at on Tuesday. And I'll also send you out the link to frequently asked questions as a result of what happened with Prop 64. That's also on our website, it's which on is the a website. really good, yeah. good link. So I'll send you both out so, so you're in the loop of what's going to happen at the, at the board. As, as it relates to uh, short-term rentals, uh, I'm having trouble... I guess getting uh, grasping the California Coastal Commission's uh, um, leverage on this, uh, uh, as far as not allowing or or restricting local jurisdictions' uh, ordinances, as it relates to coastal zoning ordinances. Coastal zoning ordinances. I understand by reading the paper that uh, homeowners association down in the Oxnard Shores area. Uh, is being taken to task by Coast, uh, CCC. What, what's going on there? I mean, we're, I can understand access, and, and there's certainly, I don't deny the access issue, um, uh, whether it's, you know, Broad Beach on the Malibu side or all the way up to, to Seacliff. Uh, what I'm having trouble with is, is extending that to individual homeowners, uh, you know, and saying you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Jurisdictional question. Yeah. I don't know where you're at. Yeah, so it's, um, and I understand there's there's currently litigation over the um, the, the Oxnard Shores issue, um, so the lawsuits are, are flying. But my understanding is the, the Coastal Commission's position is, is similar um, to what the planning director told you, that the, the county's position is now that um, short-term rentals have historically occurred on, um, of his of residential properties, and so basically the status quo is that short-term rentals aren't allowed accessory use, and so if a homeowners association or um, a city or county um, wants to ban that use, short-term rental use, then that's basically new development, quote unquote, under the Coastal Act that needs to be approved by the Coastal Commission, and so um, uh, Commissioner um, Rodriguez, you're right. The um, they, they see it as a public access issue, and so their their view is that if, if you don't allow short-term rentals and you're basically taking away places where coastal tourists will stay, and so they see it as a, an important policy issue for them. Um, so that's, legally, that's kind of how it all fits together. Um, but um, like I said, there are lawsuits, and um, I, I have a feeling that, I haven't seen the lawsuits, but I think they, the Coastal Commission's jurisdiction might be challenged in that regard. I don't know. I don't know the odds of anyone being successful there, but that's how it all fits together. Well, how do you presume an accessory use in an R1? Because it certainly doesn't say. I've is never it, seen is it, it say. Is it prescribed? Are they? It's, no, they're not. I've never seen. I, I mean, like yeah. Richard, I would think sitting in R1 has a right to assume that he's going to have R1 next door. Yeah, and presuming or assuming that it's an accessory use. Right. How do you well, get over that? Well, the concept is it's 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 residential, right? You're you're renting the house out to a family, um, and sure it's short term. But what's the difference between it's a, commercial? What's the difference between a three or four day rental and a thirty one day rental? Where do you? How do None you, to me. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, it's significant. It has a okay. significant impact. Um, He's talking know, about party hardy and someone exactly. here, some <laughs> snowbird here. <laughs> Uh, there's obviously more more dollars in short-term rentals than there is in a, in a stable long-term rental, be it be it a month or be it 12 months. Um, and I've got no I have no problem with rentals. I've rented uh, I've rented and I've been a uh, landlord. I've got no problem. With it. It's just the it's an interesting issue that not being anxious to. It is. An, it is, and obviously the county is grappling with that now and, and having that debate about how to regulate them. So. Is there anything else? Okay, I'm I will looking, adjourn I'm, this. I'm looking forward to okay. 2017. <laughs> this meeting's adjourned.
רצית להגיד פה.